welcome back to the Career Profiles podcast. I'm your host, Sean, joined as always by Johnston for another career profile on a fighter of yesteryear, a fighter who many people regard as one of the greatest fighters pound for pound all time. This fighter is Harry Greb. And in this episode, we're going to be covering his life and times, his highs and his lows, and all the stories in between. This is a fantastic episode and one that we've both been looking forward to very much. And I hope you guys that love the history of the sport are going to enjoy this one. And I think you will really enjoy this one as well. I think you will. There's plenty of information out there on Harry Greb, which is great. We can't literally get in every single story, and no matter whether they're true or not about Harry, but there's plenty of them in here. There's endless, endless stuff out there about this guy. But but all I'm going to say is Harry Greb is just, it, not only is he one of my favourite fighters of all time, but he is one half of a character. I was to say, really, we'll let, we'll let the story tell you. But what an what a interesting person and, and what a colourful guy. So it all begins with Harry Greb when he was born as Edward Harry Greb on June the 6th, 1894 on the corner of Dauphin and Fitch Street in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, USA. His dad, Pius Greb, of German-American descent, worked as a stonemason, and his mother, Anna Greb, formerly Wilbert, was a stay-at-home mum. In the summer of 1894, Pius was driving his pregnant wife, who he called Annie, to the Western Pennsylvania Hospital when her labour started early. Unable to get to the hospital on time, Edward Greb was born in their car, both his parents had German heritage, although rumours of his mother having an Irish background are believed to be untrue, and just a rumour that was spread to help make Greb more marketable because Irish boxers drew larger crowds. It has been documented that Annie gave birth to a total of six children, but only four survived. Their daughter, Lillian, who was two years older than Greb, lived at least until the age of seven before she passed away, sometime within the following ten years. Greb's older brother, who he idolised and looked up to, was Harry. He also died when he was just five years old. Greb had another three sisters, Ida, who he was very close with and who were friends growing up, Catherine, and also Clara. Many sports writers believe that Greb changed his first name to Harry when he started boxing to honour his brother's legacy and it is also believed that his surname was created for business purposes from Berg to Greb, the spelling of Berg backwards. And sometime in 1900, Greb's parents booked their own home and moved the family one block away to working class area in 138 North Millvale Avenue in the Garfield neighbourhood on the east side of Pittsburgh, three miles from the heart of the city. Now this would become Greb's childhood home and was where he made his first strides into the fighting game. Now, his father recollected a story when he was growing up. The neighbourhood bullies would pick on Greb and make him run away. But one day, Pius witnessed four older and bigger bullies grab his son and tie him up to a wagon wheel. Greb, having to fend for himself, broke free. But instead of running away, he chose to face them bullies and fight. And Pius said that he ran them down and whipped them so bad and never came round the neighbourhood again. When not having to defend himself, he spent sort of much of his spare time on the roof of his house, tending to his pigeons coop. But these were not the only birds, we should say, that Greb enjoyed spending time with. This is <laughs> something you will come up regularly. So one of his uh, former female classmates said in an interview years later that with the girls, he was the berries. I used to see him strutting around the street with them, carrying their books. When it came to a mud puddle, we'd pick them up and carry them over with gusto. If other boys approached, Greb butted them off the sidewalk like a billy goat. Now, as usual with these times, the father ran the roost and everyone had to abide by his rules or you would have to suffer the consequences. Neither of the family ever spoke of any domestic abuse, but... Indirectly, Ida made her feelings clear by never referring to their childhood home as their house. She would describe it as a father's house or father's basement. After his altercation with those bullies, Harry realised that he had a natural talent, so he instinctively decided to attend boxing gyms. 
but Pius disapproved. Pius wanted Harry to pursue a career in a respectable sport like baseball, and he remembered, my boy was very good at baseball, he should have followed baseball. He didn't want him to get involved in the rough sport of boxing, which was only just moving into the gloved era. Pius never saw his son box throughout his glittering career, but his mum and sisters would travel when possible to watch him box. In an interview, Ida recalled the first time she saw her brother indicate his love for boxing and she said he would scurry down into father's basement, stand on a box, strike a fighting stance and proclaim himself as the world's champion. Sometime after June 1908 when Greb was 14 years old, it was believed that Pius kicked him out of the house because he admitted to engaging in a boxing match. He apparently opened the door and said, no boy of mine who engages in it can live under my roof. Get out. But Ida actually squashed that rumour in an interview when she said that Greb chose to leave home although he didn't travel far. He stayed with his best mate, Walter Gemmel, on the other side of the block. About a year later, he returned when Ida sent word to him that their dad was going to sell his pigeons. His love of birds, those with wings and without, were as important to him as anything in the world. So by 16, he was an electrician's apprentice working in East Pittsburgh plant of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Corporation earning $12 a week for 10-hour shifts. Although streetcars were in use between Garfield and the plant on Penn Avenue, Greb often opted to run the two miles and to work every day. Now, by the middle of 1910, Greb finally left his family home for good living with friends for some years while continuing to work as an apprentice. He never travelled too far, probably because he wanted to keep in touch with his mother and sisters. He was seen around the town by the locals regularly and picked up the name Icky and it stuck with him throughout most of his life. He was even referred to as Icky in the local Garfield newspapers. When Greb was 18, he took his boxing more seriously and learned how to box whenever he got the chance. George Engel, who would later become manager of Greb, said that Greb worked as a runner for his brother, August, at the plant, while George was managing Frank Claus, the middleweight champion of the world. Now, August wrote his brother, who was based in New York at the time, telling him about this young kid named Harry Greb. And this is what he wrote. He said, watched him a couple of times and was greatly impressed. George Angle would later recall, my brother took a liking to Harry and finally lent him enough money to go and see me in New York. It was tough getting fights then, but I worked Greb into some good spots and he stood up beautifully. I managed him through 30 fights and never had a contract, which isn't quite true, but we'll come to that later. Eventually, no one wanted to fight him and inactivity together with his longing for Pittsburgh split us up. Now, in March of 1913, a big amateur boxing and wrestling tournament was being held at the Voldemeyer Hall just a mile away from Greb's boyhood home. Harry Greb and his mates, Emmanuel Kelly, Walter Gemmel and some others, often went to these tournaments as spectators, so for the fun of it, Greb decided to enter himself. Skipper Manning was the local trainer to many of the amateurs in the area, and he worked with Harry to get him ready for this tournament, which took place on March 10th, 1913. His first opponent was William J. Miller, an experienced amateur who had been fighting out of the famous O'Toole Club, and two months earlier had won a different amateur boxing tournament at the Valdemir Hall. Greb fought at the £145 weight limit, and the fight went the scheduled three-round distance, which surprisingly Greb won on points. Round two of the tournament took place the following night, against Al Storey, another amateur boxer who had experience in abundance. The fight went the full three rounds and according to a local newspaper, Greb's fighting last night was a revelation. The third and final night was on March the 12th and Greb's final opponent was his toughest one yet, William A. Cumpston, who went by the name Red Cumpston. He had easily beaten his previous opponents over the last two nights and one of them was by knockout. Well, Harry Greb, he acquitted himself well nicking the win and the gold medal, which actually qualified him for a trip 
to another tournament to be held in Cleveland a month later against boxers from the Cleveland AA club. Greb travelled with seven other Pittsburgh fighters to kick Cleveland, Ohio for the Intercity Boxing Chat Tournament. A bit like the Golden Gloves, um, um, this is what it was like, which was held at the Cleveland Athletic Club. Now, the fight went the full four rounds and Greb defeated George Coke by decision. He fought five more times as an amateur in less than a three-month period, but the temptation to earn money quickly was too much for Paul, so he decided to move over to the professional ranks. It all began with professional Mike Gibbons arrived in town from, from New York to fight a local welterweight, Jimmy Perry, at the Exposition Park. Now, Greb heard through the grapevine that they were looking for fighters on the undercard, so he wanted to put his name forward. However, he couldn't do it without a manager. So Greb approached the local trainer in the area, James Red Mason, to see if he would step in as his manager, in which Mason asked Greb, are you game? And Greb's response was, well, I guess yes. I fell off a 30-story house and landed on my head without being hurt. Greb's reply and uh, the fact that he had seen him um, fight in the amateurs actually convinced Mason to take on this youngster. Even though boxing was technically illegal at this point, athletic clubs started sponsoring ring activity and it was these reforms that made it possible for Pittsburgh citizens to support boxing. Mason and other managers would often arrange for a fighter from one club to fight a boxer from a different club or get a boxer from one area of town to fight a boxer from another part. And this was the situation when Greb started fighting professionally in Pittsburgh. This is also the reason why he was identified as Harry Greb of Millvale or Harry Greb of the East End to help distinguish which part of town he fought out of. Harry Greb's first professional fight took place on May 29, 1913 against Frank Kirkwood with the Pittsburgh Post printing the next day that Greb and Kirkwood opened the show with a somewhat clumsy but earnest bout. Greb had the best of it. Greb's second professional fight came two months later against Battling Murphy at Old City Hall in Pittsburgh. The next day, the Pittsburgh press wrote, The lads were excited at the bell and swung wildly. In one clinch, Greb had a close call to a fall through the ropes. Greb had the weight and punch and Murphy was joyous when the round ended. Less than a minute after the second round was underway, Murphy looked like a passenger and the referee stopped the carnage. Murphy had a leaky nose, but was otherwise uninjured. The result? took Greb to 2-0 with one stoppage. On August the 13th, 1913, Greb fought Lloyd Crutcher and knocked him out in the first round. On October the 11th, Greb was given his first real test against an experienced amateur in Harvey Hooks Evans, which went the six-round distance. The Post gave their verdict on the result the next day, and it read, A good bout, and Greb was going strong, although outpointed. Quick start and less than two weeks later, Greb was back in the ring against another more experienced fighter in Mike Milko, who gave him a very tough battle. But it was too close to call, as the next day the newspapers called it a draw. They fought again one month later at the Southside Market House in Pittsburgh, but this time Greb came out victorious. And the Post, again, the Pittsburgh Post, which is a newspaper we're going to refer to quite often, it was fight, 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 fight all the way. Quite simply a bit of a barnstormer. And, but Greb's footwork and skill made the difference in their rematch, although he did suffer a couple of cracked ribs. Now, on November 29, Greb was initially scheduled to fight George Chip. But his opponent was changed to the younger brother, Joe Chip, at the request of their manager. Now, after winning the first round, Greb was caught in the second with a right hand to the jaw that sent him down where he whacked his head against the canvas. Now, a day's Greb valiantly tried to get back to his feet before the count, but unfortunately he couldn't and lost his second pro fight. As Greb staggered back to his corner, Mason threw a bucket of water over him to wake him up. Then Chip ran over to the corner and supposedly kicked Mason. And apparently he was still pissed off about the bad things that he overheard Mason saying to Greb during the fight. Mason was taken aback by what had happened, but then someone from the crowd handed him a cane, which he took and began swinging at Chip. 
Before things could escalate any further, some of the crowd actually entered the ring and managed to intervene. Now, it was written in the paper the next day that bystanders prevented a flare-up. The KO was a thriller. This would be the first, the only, and the last time that Greb would ever be knocked out by a punch. But he was outweighed by almost 15 pounds by Chip that night. Greb offered no excuses. He simply said he lost to the better man, but also said that from then on, I will not go out of my class and meet a man who weighs 156 pounds in the afternoon, while I only scale 142. Now, interestingly, Greb would go back on his word, as he was famous for fighting much heavier men throughout his illustrious career. He would often be 60 pounds lighter and six inches shorter than his opponents. In the last month of 1913, Greb fought twice more. One week after his knockout loss, he won a six-rounder against Harvey Battle in Sherbine. And six days later, he knocked out Terry Nelson in the third round. The following year, 1914 began with Greb, and he fought and beat Whitey Wenzel twice in the month of January, edging newspaper decisions. Wenzel was a fellow Pittsburgh lad who would eventually battle Greb ten times in all, the most any fighter would ever fight Greb. Their battles became local favourites that everyone wanted to see, with the fans knowing that they were going to see a good scrap. The fights had a box office draw total of about $600 a fight, with general admission costing 50 cents and a dollar for the closer seats. Their fourth meeting in the summer was described yet again by the Pittsburgh boats, and this is what they wrote about that fight. Greb made a great rally in the sixth round to pull out a draw. If a hairline decision was absolutely necessary, Wenzel would probably get it. The scrap was a hummer. Wenzel fought hard all the time and did most of the forcing. Wenzel, taller than his opponent, with about five pounds advantage in weight, was not quite so clever, but he was always a willing mixer. The first round was fierce but even. Greb had a shade in the second after opening the round with a 30-second barrage. The third was practically even. The fourth was Wenzel's big round. He jabbed Greb till his head bobbed like a fisherman's cork and whipped over his right tellingly. Wenzel added to his lead in the fifth. Greb won the sixth handily as Wenzel was leg weary but in no danger. Some great fights by the sounds of it for the local guys in Pittsburgh and Greb won two out of the next three matches as the crowd started getting larger as people heard what great fights they were. However, Greb started figuring out Wenzel's style and he began beating him handsomely at his own game and ended up taking a 10-fight series with eight wins and drawing twice. Greb started another rivalry in 1914 against middleweight Faye Kiza, who had battled a total of nine times that span over 10 years from 1914 to 1924. So most of their fights were newspaper bouts with two official decisions going to Greb and Kaza, like Wenzel had only mustered two draws. So basically there was the, the, the two official decisions went to Greb. The other ones were newspaper decisions that were just sort of mainly Greb. I think there was a draw in there for Kaza, a bit like Wenzel. And amongst his two rivalries, Greb fought his first heavyweight on July 20, 1914 against John Honey Foley, a local Pittsburgh boy who actually outweighed Greb by a full 30 pounds. Now, you've got to remember, Harry Greb, I think his maximum was 170, literally the last year of his career. Barring that, he never, he never got no higher than 168, Greb. Now, Greb took the match an unbelievable short notice, literally minutes, in fact. Originally scheduled to fight Kayser or Ray Parks, Foley came in at the very last minute and offered to fight Greb to keep the ticket holders happy. The Pittsburgh Post reported on the first showing against a heavyweight. And this is what they said. They said Greb's speed earned him the victory, although he didn't hurt Foley one bit, beyond blood in his nose. In the fourth round, Foley was at his best and got to Greb repeatedly, but could not land a finisher. And Greb kept out of danger for the rest of the time. The following month, Greb, well, he met Foley again for another six-rounder at Valdemore Hall on August the 31st, 1914. But this time, they both had time to prepare. But the outcome was the same, with Greb using his speed. And the Post wrote that Greb reigning in blow after blow while avoiding and blocking heavy returns. Greb was awarded another victory, with a headline reading, Foley, victim of worst ever ring beating. Greb would go on to fight many heavyweights and enjoyed it. And Greb once said, 
I like to fight as often as I can, for that keeps me in shape. I also like to tackle the big fellows around 200 pounds, for they are slower and easier to hit than the little fellows. The bigger they come, the easier they generally are when they have to face speed. Foley gave him his first taste of what it would be like, but he would go on to feast on bigger men for the rest of his career. In total, Greb had 17 fights in 1914, winning 12, drawing 4 and losing once. The following year, Greb took on the legendary Jack Chappie Blackburn, who had been released from prison the year before. With Jack Johnson still world heavyweight champion, but only months away from being dethroned by Jess Willard, it was very unusual for a white fighter to take on an African-American, especially someone as good as Blackburn. However, Greb never hid behind the colour line. His desire was to be the best he could be, and to do that he would need to fight the best no matter what colour his opponents were. Greb was shorter than Blackburn, but was carrying a little more weight, but both were used to fighting bigger and stronger men. The fight took place on January 25th, 1915 in Pittsburgh and Greb was eager to get into shape for the hardest battle of his career so far. His usual training regime was sparring six rounds with different partners from many different weight classes. He would run 10 miles, do extensive exercises in the gym and finish with a rub down by a woman or two, no doubt. According to the Pittsburgh Post, three days prior to the bout, Greb was sparring with a heavyweight so hard that he knocked him down for the count. And it was the Pittsburgh Post that also described the six-round action. Through a million punches, but few landed. Backburn blocked, sidestepped, slipped, rode and ducked. Now, from the first to the final bell, Blackburn was in the centre of a cloud of gloves. But he was so elusive that not one in ten ever connected. Greb was on him all the time. And as Blackburn didn't start one-tenth the blows that Greb did, Greb must have accorded the decision. Blackburn landed some body punches, but they didn't have any steam to slow Greb down. Greb solved Blackburn's defence well in the third round after winning the first two. The fourth was even and Blackburn had the edge in the fifth. Greb had practically done all the fighting in the sixth. Although Blackburn had only been out of prison for, what, nine months and was not the same fighter he once was, this was a massive statement by Greb, who had started to make a name for himself beyond Pittsburgh now. So the next month, Greb fought Philadelphia's star middleweight Harry K.O. Baker at the famous Decane Gardens in Pittsburgh. Once again, the Pittsburgh Post wrote that Harry Greb fought like a combined human dynamo and enraged tiger and was an easy winner at the end. He was entitled to a clear shade in every round, but the fifth, which was close. He won by a newspaper decision. But the way Greb finished the last round, it was said to be the fastest finish the experts had seen the entire season. He showed excellent stamina, switched the angles and mixed his shots to the body and, and head effortlessly. His battle with Blackburn had clearly played dividends. To celebrate his win, he had a party where he invited a future wife, Mildred Riley, who had been dating for a while at the time. Now, after the party, a local newspaper actually wrote about the gathering and referred to the young lady as the Belle of the Little Washington, her hometown. Greb read it very carefully. Obviously, he could read, but still not brilliantly. And before asking his friend what Belle meant, he didn't know either. So sometime later, Greb was actually found in this party. He's gone into this back room. He's in a, looking at a dictionary, trying to find out the word. And it, he finally lifted up his head when his mate finally found him. He said, it's all right. That guy didn't call her any names. And I'll tell you what, God help him if he did, because he didn't like reporters. A month later, and Greb fought Baker in a rematch, and he won convincingly once again. Greb's press coverage became more detailed. He was now a genuine middleweight contender, and his fights went from the undercard to the headliner. One of the headline fights was against another middleweight contender in Joe Borrell, the guy he lost to the year before in a fight he took at short notice. This time he was eager to exact revenge on 22nd of April 1915 at the Decane Gardens in Pittsburgh. Greb trained as usual at the Garfield Athletic Club, but they decided to go through a rebrand on their colour scheme, opting for blue and white. To promote the club and its new colours, they all went to the fight and asked Greb to speak with the Pittsburgh Post. 
Greb contacted sports writer Harry Keck, who would eventually become one of Greb's closest friends. They talked on the phone, and Keck wrote their conversation in a newspaper the next day. Greb said, Well, to make a long story short, they asked me to wear blue and white tights when I fought Borel, and they'll all wear blue and white ribbons or badges or blue and white somethings. I always wear green tights, but I had to promise to wear blue and white ones this time. If I get licked, I'm going back to the green ones, but if I win, I'm going to stick to the new boys. What do you think of that idea? Keck said. It listens all right and it sounds like a pretty good story, Greb replied. You bet your life it does. Guess I'll say goodbye, but don't forget to put a piece in the paper about it tomorrow. All the boys will be looking for it. A few minutes later, Greb's manager, Jimmy Mason, entered the office and he was told about it. His response was priceless. He said, blue and white's not such a bad combination. All he'll need is to spill a little blood and he'll look like the American flag. Greb was outweighed by 15 pounds, but he showed more experience than his opponent, the improvements he had made since their first fight by taking the first three rounds. But the general consensus amongst many of the papers suggested that Borrell won the last three. Therefore, the fight was declared a draw after six rounds. Then on December 16, 1915, Greb fought another top contender in Perry Kid Graves at the Power Auditorium in Pittsburgh. Graves took the first round, but Greb managed to win the second, even though he injured himself in the process. Then the, the Post wrote that his face screwed up, bore testimony to the pain he was suffering. So while Greb was in the corner, after round two, a physician examined his arm and found that the radial bone had been fractured in his left arm when he punched Graves in the head early in the second round. But he didn't stop then. Instead, he continued to fight and win the second round with his broken arm. The referee, of course, had no option but to stop the fight, which gave Graves the stoppage victory. He actually presented his x-ray to people that clearly showed that the radius was completely fractured and the jagged edges or the jagged ends were actually overlapping. That must have been excruciating. Greb was originally scheduled to fight Michael Dowd five days later in St. Paul, Minnesota, but of course he couldn't fight due to his broken arm. Greb only took two months out of the ring when he should have taken longer. But his manager, Red Mason, actually found a positive when interviewed on February 22nd, 1916 about the accident and how the recovery was going. And Mason said that he thought the accident was a good thing because it would make a two-handed fighter of Icky. The Pittsburgh Press on February 22nd wrote that before the accident, Greb was notoriously a left-handed boxer. With the southpaw, he could hit at all angles, but with the right, he, he had been very awkward and slow. So Mason's theory that Graves may be the unwitting cause of the development of Greb's right hand is, well, we'll come to that in a minute, but it's, it's not a bad theory and it probably is correct. A bit like the Cinderella man when he'd done his hand in. So Greb actually made some key changes after his arm was broken and he's working with his right arm a lot more, uh, making it stronger, which is pretty, if not stronger, is equal to his left. He, he also increased his distance in running to raise his stamina, which was actually assisted by a professional long distance runner called Huey Bruce, who at the time would accompany Greb on his morning long distance runs. It was also said that Greb had now developed a pair of lungs and wind that ought to carry him through any ordinary bout at top speed. With all the hard work Greb had done to get himself in shape and strengthen his right hand, it all unravelled in his early return against Walter Monaghan when he re-injured his arm in the second round but managed to fight on to a draw. It took another two months for Greb to finally return against Kid Manuel on April the 1st 1916 which he won in a very close decision so close that they did it again in June at the Power Auditorium in Pittsburgh. But there was no doubt in their rematch when Greb showed just how much stronger his right hand had become when he knocked out Manuel in the first round with a vicious right hook that had Manuel unconscious for several minutes after. Greb would go on to have another 14 fights in 1916 and a total of 19 for the year and his most challenging was a draw against his stablemate Al Graber in August at the Power Auditorium, again in Pittsburgh. 
The two fighters were so confident of beating each other that they bet almost their entire purse on themselves, making it a winner-takes-all bout. Fred Mason, who managed both, sat in a neutral corner and watched on, but there is uncertainty on how it finished. Some list the fight as a win for Greb's record, but in the book, Fearless Harry Greb, it states that the newspapers called it a draw in a close fight. The following year, in 1917, Greb fought 37 times in a single year, along for the ride where his adoring fans... Greb complimented his followers in this chaotic and active year by saying, the Garfield fans were the making of me in the boxing game. They were out rooting for me every time I boxed as an amateur and they have kept it up every bout I have had around here since I entered the professional ranks. Their encouragement has helped me to win many a fight. 37 fights, we will go through some of these and I mean, it's insane. So Greb had his first fight in 1917 on New Year's Day in a rematch against Joe Burrell at the Powell Auditorium in Pittsburgh again and wanted revenge after they drew in 1915. An improved Greb took the nod over six rounds, taking a newspaper decision. And by the end of March, he had accumulated four knockouts in nine fights, although he did slip up against Mike Gibbons, losing a narrow points decision. That defeat wasn't too damaging for Greb due to his its narrow margins and it did mean that he needed to defeat a guy called Young Ahern on April 2nd once again at the powerhouse called a a top contender by many newspapers this Young Ahern with the exception of Mike Gibbons and and Ahern owns the owns the biggest rep of any chap Harry had ever faced so this guy was had a decent name decent pedigree behind him well, Greb, he made a huge statement when he landed a terrific right hand that had Hearn reeling and trying to recover in the very first round. Greb then threw a short right that landed on the chin, dropping him on the ropes where he hung half in and half out of the ring, forcing the referee Ed Kennedy to count him out. Now, after the fight, Hearn said Greb actually got lucky. He actually said that just to show it was luck, pure and simple, I'll come back and meet this fella for nothing. I won't even ask for the cab fare, he said. Greb replied a day later, the knockout was no fluke. I hit a hern with one of the cleanest and most solid punches I ever landed on an opponent. It was the last right hand that turned the trick. Interestingly, a hern with all of his trash talk never ever took that rematch. Not surprised. <laughs> now in April, Greb would finally get his chance to fight for the middleweight title against Al McCoy, who had a claim to the middleweight championship of the world on and off since 1914. Greb was scheduled to fight him on April the 30th, but unfortunately there was a catch. The fight was ordered to be a newspaper decision bout and not an official decision. Therefore, Greb had to knock out McCoy within 10 rounds to capture the title, otherwise the champion would keep the title. Greb was in no position to change those demands, so he took the offer to fight McCoy under these conditions. In front of 5,000 spectators at the Exposition Hall, also called Exposition Music Hall, or simply Expo Hall in Pittsburgh, Greb could only win by a newspaper decision. The Associated Press wrote, Greb won every round. Never did he fight an easier opponent, and never did he fight a more determined and ferocious battle. Greb did everything imaginable to McCoy. He hit him enough times to sink a fleet of gunboats. Many times. Greb pumped in stiff punches in such profusion that it seemed impossible that McCoy could stand the gaff. McCoy admitted after the fight that it was the worst ring beating he had ever received as a fighter and he was later referred to as the cheese champion because it was obvious to everybody that he lost the fight overwhelmingly. The fight was so easy for Greb that he fought just three days later in Maryland to a 20-round draw against Jackie Clark. Greb took two more huge scalps before he even got halfway through this impressive year, beating both former middleweight champions in Jeff Smith and George Chip by newspaper decision over 10 rounds. Following those victories, the papers began printing that Greb had been the busiest fighter in the United States and that he was now recognised as the leader Latin. He absolutely pounds the middleweight champion to an oblivion and he doesn't win at all because he doesn't stop him. It's just saying so unfair. Well, the newspaper's observations were proven to be spot on after Greb knocked out Frank Mantell in just one round and Buck Krause in six. 
Both these wins came after Greb suffered a deep head gash that required four stitches in a sparring session with a heavyweight. On July 3rd, 1917, a newspaper wrote that Greb is just about as close to the middleweight championship of the world right now as any of the contenders. And he will be a hard man for anybody to beat. The Pittsburgh Post continued with their high assessment of their local hero. Pittsburgh stands a good chance of having the future middleweight champion in Harry Greb. In his own way, he is a veritable Stanley Ketchell. So it's high praise indeed. So in the middle of August, Greb took a short but well-deserved one-week vacation or holiday, as we say over here, from August the 19th to the 26th at Connaught Lake, located in Pennsylvania Mountain Resort, about two hours north of Pittsburgh. After a little break, Greb was back in the ring against the light heavyweight champion battling Levinsky at the baseball stadium in Falls Field in Pittsburgh. Now, this was the first of six bouts of theirs. His opponent weighed a little over 180 pounds to Greb's 160. I mean, 20 pounds. Levinsky was three inches taller. Greb was 5'8", and Levinsky was 5'11", and had a longer reach as well. I mean, with all these disadvantages against him, Greb was still confident of the win, even though Levinsky's title wasn't on the line. And now, again, these guys just don't put a title on against, against these guys. And Greb won the fight with ease. Of course he did, and was called a perpetual motion fighting machine. Levinsky actually responded to his poor showing when he was interviewed in his dressing room after the fight. He said, wasn't I rotten? Gee, wasn't I rotten? I couldn't get my left working. I couldn't plant my right. Gee, wasn't I rotten? You certainly was by the sounds of it, mate. <laughs> well, a week, <laughs> a week later, the Chicago writer and referee, Ed W. Smith, well, he wrote a piece on Greb after his second victory over Jeff Smith at the Auditorium in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, explaining how good Greb had become. And he said, Harry, who is a clean, decent young man with all the appearance of good habits and excellent morals, is one of the weird freaks of the ring. From the opening bell, he tears in with an assortment of punches that are freakish and quaint. He regards nothing that was ever written in any authoritative book on the art of self-defence. He constantly leads with his right, which is strictly in discord with all the proper teachings of the ring, and does other things so foolishly that he proves a wonderful fellow. Against Smith last night, he tore in for the full 30 minutes, never gave Jeff a chance to set himself for a telling punch, and when the end was reached, he had the jerseyite gasping for breath and glancing around for a rocking chair. Harry scores every second of the time with something or other, no matter how foolish it may look. He hooks and swings, he jabs and uppercuts, he ducks and sidesteps, and the man in front of him, clever as he may be, is made to look foolish. Jeff, being a great defensive fighter, was able to block and throw off many of Greb's punches, but in doing so, he was made to appear slow and unskillful. Greb is so awkward and comes at an opponent in such a variety of ways that there is absolutely no way of figuring him out. Great assessment there. And on December 8, 1917, Greb and Terry Martin fought ten, a 10 round newspaper decision rematch in Pennsylvania. Now, during the last minute of the third round, Greb knocked Martin down twice. Then he threw a short right, which knocked Martin out for a whole five minutes, winning the fight by a third round knockout. The knockout of Martin was Greb's 13th and final KO of the year. The Pittsburgh Post's headline was Harry Greb was busiest boxer in country last year, earned $28,753, which was quite a lot of money back then. And Greb averaged one fight every 10 days in 1917. A newspaper printed that Greb's record stands out as one of the most remarkable chapters that have ever been written in the Queensbury history. I mean, it's tr it really was. It, it was a tremendous effort by Greb to remain as active as he did. But his charge on the middleweight title was halted because of the war, which began in 1914. However, the United States only began its active involvement by the President's declaration in April of 1917. Now, the United States drafted 4 million men to serve the Great War, so on January 7th, 1918, the local papers wrote that Greb was figuring 
on keeping as busy as possible for he is likely to be called to any army before long and he wants just as many scalps as possible before joining the olive drab. Now, before Greb was inevitably drafted, he fought the middleweight champion, Marco Dald, on February the 25th, 1918 at St. Paul, Minnesota. There was no knockout after 10 rounds, so old Dald obviously kept his title. Once again, another fight where he doesn't knock him out, and he kept his title by default. But two papers favoured Greb, as did uh, referee Jules Barton, although the other three papers called it a close fight for old Dald, with one calling it a draw. Records suggest that a draw was the right result, but it didn't matter to Greb because he still hadn't won a world title because he didn't knock him out. That's what he needed to do and he didn't do it. So a Minnesota sports writer, Fred Coburn, actually wrote that Greb's dancing in and out style was a puzzle for O'Dald for the major portion of the encounter and at no time was Michael able to solve it with any strumptious effect. So it was just a, another easy ride for Greb, really. The following month, Greb fought African-American Willie Langford. And the Pittsburgh Post wrote that Greb, waving the colour line, obtained a decision in the six-round bout against Willie Langford. Langford was the second African-American Greb fought, the first being in the Hall of Famer Jack Blackburn in April. In April, Greb had a boil on his forehead removed, but by the time he returned to Pittsburgh, he had become seriously ill from the procedure and had to be admitted to Pittsburgh's Mercy Hospital. There were further complications after the operation, which actually led to blood poisoning and almost escalated to full-blown pneumonia. After taking a month out, Greb declared that he was fit and strong again. So he began his war duties by participating in the New York Open Air Boxing Exhibition, which was to be part of a big Navy recruitment and Liberty Loan event. Commander Newton Mansfield promoted the fights on a ship called the USS Recruit, the boxing exhibitions were held aboard the ship and attracted around 40,000 people. The exhibition was a way to draft men aged between 21 and 30. The feature event was Greb fighting two heavyweights in the same night, Jim Coffey and Joe Bonds over three rounds each. Greb won both on points and almost stopped Coffey. Four days after the exhibition, Greb answered the call to enlist in a regiment of his choice. So he and his mucker Johnny Ray both chose to enlist in the Navy. While waiting for his orders, Greb prepared for a fight against Soldier Bartfield on May the 20th, 1918 by having two bouts in between against Al McCoy and Clay Turner. He won both by decision and was ready for Bartfield. So in front of 4,000 in attendance at the Forbes field, Greb engaged in a rematch against Bartfield that he credited as the toughest fight he could remember. Now, Greb took the first six rounds but dropped the pace from round seven to nine. The Associated Press said that he fought back with all his might and literally pounded Bartfield all over the ring. They were fighting like Tigers at the finish. It was Greb's round and fight. They met again for a rubber match just nine days later in Toledo, Ohio, but it was not as competitive with, with Greb taking 13 of the 15 rounds. It was just a, a walkover and Greb, was currently in the Naval Reserves and now uh, represented them in boxing tournaments. And his next fight was actually against a guy called Zulu Kid in a Red Cross tournament on June 20th at Madison Square Garden. I believe well, this was his first fight there. And the event actually raised $18,000 to help support wounded soldiers. And according to the Pittsburgh Post, the Pittsburgh Fury played with the rugged but clumsy Italian for six rounds going at speed and throwing gloves so fast that the opponent could do little but cover. This was the third time that Greb defeated Kid Zulu and he would beat him again a fourth time in 1919. But before that, the time had come for Greb to join the Navy for World War I. So on July 24, he actually wrote a letter, letter from land or the land battleship in New York to all of his fans in Pittsburgh. And the Pittsburgh Post actually printed this letter with a picture of Greb in his uniform. And this is what it said. It said, just writing a few lines to let you know that I'm still alive and attached to land battleship here in New York. I expect to see more active service before long. And so does Johnny Ray, who is here with me. I have several bats booked ahead, for most of which I will require only short furloughs. These bouts all help in recruiting work I am listed for as we 
never fail to get some recruits everywhere our box. Ray is doing the same work as yours truly and expects soon to be put on active service. So one of these days, the pair of us will be placed on deck of a real ship on the ocean and sent to points unknown. Johnny and I act as boxing instructors to a big bunch of fellows. Here's sending my best to all my friends in Pittsburgh and hoping to have a hand in deciding the biggest battle I was ever in. That same month, the military held a boxing contest between the Army and the Navy to see who could win the title of the middleweight championship of the United States Armed Forces. Champion of the Army was middleweight Eddie McGurty and Greb was the champion of the Navy. Their fight took place at Fort Sheridan in Illinois. After 10 rounds in which Greb was dominant, the referee gave him the decision and crowned him the middleweight champion of the US Armed Forces. Greb fought three more times before beginning his serious Navy work. One of those was when he disposed of Battling Levinsky. Following his win on August 6, 1918, Greb challenged Jack Dempsey to a fight for the first time and the newspaper headline read, Greb beats Levinsky, challenges Dempsey. The article stated that Greb announced that he was anxious to take on Jack Dempsey. He was given three days leave from the Navy when he arrived home in Pittsburgh in October. And during those days, Greb took his new car out for a burn with his manager, Mason. And by the account of his manager, he was safer on the Navy ship. He told Harry Keck of the Pittsburgh Post, Say, you know, how that guy Greb fights, don't you? Just fights and fights and fights. All the time going. Well, that's just the way he drives that car. Now, he also said that never again. Never on my word of honour will I take another ride with that young fellow. Never. <laughs> Sounds like he was a, a very fast driver indeed. <laughs> <laughs> now, by the end of October, Greb and Johnny Ray were placed on a real battleship. Not a fake one, like the USS Recruit, and they actually participated in real battle. Greb was stationed as part of the gun crew. Then in November, he wrote to his sports writer friend Harry Keck at the Pittsburgh Post and said, He finds life on board the ship better training for fighting than his former task with the recruiting branch of the Navy. Wrestling 108-pound shells for the biggest gun on the ship is much to his liking. So while on his way to France, believe it or not, to face French and European heavyweight champion Georges Carpenter, the war actually ended on November 11, 1918. They eventually arrived in France, but Greb didn't fight Carpenter. Instead, he and Ray travelled to London uh, for the King's Tournament, which actually took place at the Royal Albert Hall on December 11. Harry Greb fought at the Royal Albert Hall. Incredible. Well, Greb, while at the Royal Albert Hall, he knocked out Corporal A. Well, a Corporal of South Africa. No one could actually precisely get his name right. He knocked this guy out in the first round. The next day, Greb lost a four-round decision against Private Ring. But the American army and Navy men eventually won 10 of the 12 fights against the British army. Greb arrived back uh, home in P Pittsburgh and was met by his long-term girlfriend, Mildred Riley, sometime in December. It was later revealed that the couple would get married on January the 27th, but the date clashed with a big money fight against soldier Bartfield. So what does Harry Greb do? Well, he changed the date of the ceremony to three days later. He can't be losing out on money, Harry, can he? So Greb went on to fight Leo Hook, Earl uh, Young Fisher, Paul Sampson Corner, and Soldier Bartfield before his wedding day. Greb took care of business, but in all four, and then got married as promised. And Ke Keck wrote that, of course, Greb arrived at the church late, he has a habit of doing things snappily and in a hurry. Due to his popularity, 1,000 people waited outside uh, for the happy couple to complete their vows. In typical Greb fashion, he blamed his lateness because he was training and the next day the newlyweds went to the Union Station to take a train to Cleveland where Greb was boxing in another match against Tommy Robson. And a guy he beat easily as well, by the way. And on March 17, 1919, Greb fought the heavyweight Bill Brennan at the Decane Gardens in a rematch. And this is what Keck wrote. It was Greb's fight 
by a mile. He won every round. And in the last round, he had the vanquisher of Levinsky, Coffee, and a host of other crack heavyweights, arm weary, leg weary, and groggy. Around this time, Mason had a terrible couple of years. And I mean, terrible, really bad. He lost his wife to double pneumonia and influenza. His father actually died and his sister passed away. But in most tragically of all, during a Christmas time, when his only son, James Jr., was searching for toys, he thought were in a cupboard. He actually was burned to death by, believe it or not, uh, hazardous chemicals in the cupboard, which were flammable. I mean, uh, absolutely heartbreaking story for Mason. And it was a sign of those times where children were often played next to these hazardous, hazardous objects. But wow, what a, what a dreadful time it was for Greb's manager, Mason. Yeah, really sad. Really sad little side story there for, for Mason. Horrible, horrible thought of it, to be honest with you. By the summer of 1919, promoters began to try and match the new heavyweight champion, Jack Dempsey, who had defeated Jess Willard against Harry Greb. On July the 21st, 1919, a headline read, Greb Dempsey, fight probable, two promoters offer purses. The first promoter, Matt Hinkle, also a referee, was willing to put up $65,000 for the men to fight for Labor Day night in Cleveland's American League Park over 10 rounds. The second promoter was Jimmy Shelvin, who wanted to take the fight to the Cincinnati Reds ballpark also on Labor Day. However, he wanted the fight to be a 15-round affair. Harry Greb wanted the fight so badly that Jimmy Mason was in talks with both the promoters to make it happen. All they needed was Dempsey's signature. Dempsey decided not to take up the challenge and instead for heavyweight Bill Brennan, who Greb had already beaten three times in February, March and July. After fighting with Greb and Dempsey, Brennan called out his potential winner. If Dempsey was fighting that little buzz star instead of me, I would bet on Greb. Now the author Bill Stern wrote an article about the failed negotiations and, and calls out Dempsey's manager, Jack Kearns, not wanting his man in the ring against Greb and he wrote, Kearns refused to entertain any notions about a Dempsey Greb bout, but many of Greb's backers and well wishers did entertain the notion and were convinced Greb would have made a bigger fool out of Jack in a regular bout. Greb himself was so certain about the outcome of such a fight that he needled Dempsey whenever he saw him and he said, Hey, you bum, when you're gonna fight me? Just imagine, imagine a 147 pounder calling out a heavyweight, and not just a heavyweight the world's heavyweight champion, the legendary Jack Dempsey. It's brilliant. It's, it's crazy. Uh, but it's difficult to argue with that assessment, especially when you investigate both careers where Greb fought and beat many of the same men Dempsey fought. So we're going to run off some names. They say, so Willie Meehan, Ed Gumboat Smith, Terry Keller, Battling Levinsky, Tommy Gibbons, Billy Minsk, Joe Bonds, Bill Brennan, Homer Smith, Jimmy Darcy and Gene Tunney, and that's just to name a few. So it just shows, you know, as he's a, he's a middleweight, super middleweight, every, that's where he weighs, it was his weight, you know, but he, he, he's knocking out everyone, beating heavyweights. Well, as we know, the fight didn't materialise, with many suggesting that it was Dempsey that did not want to face Greb because he had everything to lose and absolutely nothing to gain by fighting the smaller man, which is true. Now, Greb would have been clearly frustrated to not get that Dempsey fight, so he was like a man possessed. And from March to September 1919, where he actually won 20 fights or 23 fights on the spin and was just one fight behind his best tally the year before of 37 fights in one calendar year. I mean, it's an incredible feat. So on September the 7th at Pittsburgh, a Pittsburgh Post actually headlined that Greb will set new boxing mark for year. So. Here is the beginning of this article, and it said that Harry Greb this year will break all records ever made for the number of fights fought is, is a sure thing. As right now, counting the two fights he had during the past week against Jeff Smith and battling Levinsky, the total is 36. This number, with almost four months to go of the year, will likely run up to 50 fights, something unheard of in the ring at this present time, or even any present time before Harry. It's insane. In the 36 fights already full, only four of them have taken place here in Greb's hometown. 
And this more than anything proves what a great attraction Greb is wherever he fights. In all these fights, not one of them have been called a draw by any of the newspapers where these battles have been fought. While on course to complete 50 fights in a year, Greb fell sick on September 21st and Mason explained how it happened and his present condition at the time and he said that in Greb's last win against Silent Martin, he had a difficult time accomplishing this task because of his boils. A boil on the back of his head was broken open from a blow by Martin's fist and that night he got deathly sick. By December the 22nd, Greb had accumulated 45 fights and 45 victories. Then just days after his victory over Clay Turner, Greb became ill again and was forced to cancel all fights for the rest of the month. He suffered an attack of potamine poisoning. Now due to this, Greb finished on 45 fights in 1919, equating to almost a fight a week. But the fact that he was forced to take a couple of months off due to illness and was in the Navy, makes this feat even more remarkable. His record of 45 fights with 45 wins in a single year still stands today and will probably never ever be broken. As Greb entered the prime of his boxing career, he hit another milestone in his life outside of the ring too, when he got married and had a daughter, Dorothy. Greb eventually returned to the ring in February 1920 against Zulu Kid. He took a newspaper decision against his old foe for the fifth time in his career. The Kalamazoo Gazette also revealed an us another issue that Greb had faced, and it said at the conclusion of the eighth round, the announcement was made that Greb was fighting with a broken right arm, the injury being received over six weeks ago. Greb undoubtedly gave a fine exhibition of one-handed fighting, but the bout was nevertheless generally unsatisfactory. <laughs> I'm not surprised he's broke his arm and it's unsatisfactory. All them fights, I mean, it's incredible, but Greg fought six times from February to April 1920, winning all newspaper decisions or by official decision. So those obviously where there's two judges and a ref, at which time rumours were spread by James Red Mason that again, that Dempsey and Greb were going to fight 10 round battle in Buffalo on May 31st. However, once again, Dempsey refused to fight Greb in May but he was willing to spar with him. So for three days in a row, from July 27 to 29, 1920, Greb sparred with Dempsey. Now it is believed that Greb approached Dempsey and asked to spar with him in hope that he would forge a close enough relationship that he would someday lead to an official fight. The sparring sessions took place at Dempsey's training ground in Broadway and 57th Street in New York, with 2,000 people paying 55 cents to watch. So on July 27th, they met in the afternoon, and as they reported, boxed four hard rounds. The second day went pretty much the same as the first. But then on the third day and the final day, so many fans actually attended that many had to be turned away at the doors. The sparring session was so eagerly anticipated that the famous actor Douglas Fairbanks travelled to New York just to be the referee. Now, Greb was also eager to capitalise on his opportunity because it was possibly the last time he could get Dempsey in the ring. Now, the Pittsburgh Post would write later that same day, a big surprise was sprung on those present by the way Greb tore into the champion and in the middle of the second round, time had been called when the Pittsburgher landed a right hand on Dempsey's left eye and split it open. After the eye was damaged, Dempsey, well, he didn't want to lose face, so he agreed to continue boxing. But after a couple of more exchanges, he told them that he would have to call it a day and he called it off. It was also written that Greb looked as strong as a young bull. The crowd loved Greb and he was actually surrounded on all sides after this, this uh, encounter with Dempsey. And Dempsey had been apprehensive about battling Greb before these sparring sessions and he was sure wasn't in a hurry to fight him again anytime soon after this. So it's a good workout for Greb because in a few days he was heading back to Pittsburgh to fight another future heavyweight opponent of Dempsey's, Tommy Gibbons. It's mental to think that they actually shared the ring together, though, isn't it? I, I you know, I it never is. knew, I never knew that they shared the ring together, albeit sparring sessions. Greb clearly wanted to show Dempsey 
you know, what it was made of. And, and, and like I say, it was only sparring sessions, but it just kind of makes you think about what could have really happened should they have fought for real. You know, that was, for Harry Greb, that was probably real. He probably wanted to prove to Dempsey that he could beat him. And by doing what he did and ends up splitting the left eye open, you know, that kind of proves that he was hitting him more often than not. So it's quite a, a fantasy thought, really, of, of these two getting in the ring and obviously it being close to it happening. Interesting story and, and really you know, great to hear that they actually did eventually share the ring together, albeit sparring. Now, while in New York, Greb took an opportunity to visit the very popular and famous Olive Thomas, who was an American silent film actress, art model and photo model. He handed her a note of introduction from a mutual Pittsburgh friend. She told the author of Give Him to the Angels, the story of Harry Greb, James R. Fair, how he knew I was there. I'll never know. But he came backstage and handed the note to me. I received him warmly, as I always receive people from home, and I could see that he mistook it for the rush act. His face showed it. It showed that if he ever had doubts as to whether a girl was itching, simply itching for his presence, he wasn't having them now. Greb's response was to the point as usual, and he said, You've got some swell shape there, Olive. I think I'm going to like you. Let's bounce out and have a piece of whiskey and a talk. Miss Thomas recalled, There were a lot of people backstage. I was afraid there would be a riot, so I told Greb to come with me, and we left. They ended up at a cabaret eight blocks away, and Olive recalled to James, We were recognised the moment we entered. You could hear them saying, That's Harry Greb, the prize fighter, and Olive Thomas, the Foley's girl. Greb reached over and put her hand in his. A shocked Olive said, Mind you, we had only met ten minutes before, and it was our first meeting. Greb, not one to beat around the bush, then told her, I'm crazy about you, Olive. How do we stand? She replied, I admire you as a pugilist. Fine, fine, said Greb. Come down to my hotel room and let's... Well, that blank, I think he's pretty self-explanatory. Olive Thomas didn't reveal the word he actually used, but I think we've got a good idea. <laughs> Piece of whiskey and a talk. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so Olive wasn't actually shocked by his forwardness. However, the volume of his voice was the problem. She continued with her side of the story as well. And she said that, did he have to yell for everyone to hear? Couldn't he have whispered or written it on out or made signs? Failing this, he could have said, hey, Olive, how's about putting up your skirt for a pal? But there we are in plain view and easy hearing for all those rowdy people with his voice carrying a block and he blurts out that awful bathroom word. I didn't know what else to do, so I hid my face in my arms and I cried. <laughs> oh, bless her. It was at this point that Greb called his mate, James R. Fair, and he told him to get down there and... And he arrived very quickly. He saw Greb sitting next to the dance floor, floor with uh, Olive face down, crying, while everybody in the cabaret, which was packed to the rafters, by the way, was just screwing Greb angry as well. And they were insulting, insulting him and, and his, because obviously he's embarrassed this famous beauty girl actress. He, of course, didn't give a shit. He didn't care about the booze and the jeers and the stares. He literally just sat there without a care in the world. And uh, James Fair recalled that I asked Greb, why, why all the fuss? He didn't say anything for a good two minutes. He was waiting for someone to start something, but no one did. Then he got up, glowering defiantly and turning his battered features around so he, he couldn't miss anyone. He dropped a $20 bill on the table and snapped, paid a check and take this floozy home. And he left. Not long after that, Greb spoke with James about Ms. Tom Thomas. And, and he, he actually said that she had a chance to yank her panty down and, and make us both happy. But she didn't do it. I wasted the whole night. It was more like half hour, apparently. Finding out that all she does is throw it around on stage. That's what he said. So uh, <laughs> he wanted a bit of olive and she didn't want to give it to him. Yeah, he certainly didn't get a bit of olive that night, certainly. And um, <laughs> you know, to be honest with you, he's, 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 he doesn't make him sound very good. Like He's obviously just clearly thinking that because of who he is, he can, he can get a bit You know, with somebody that's, yep. that's near enough just as famous as him. But in this case, it weren't going to happen. 
Well, the reason why Greb wanted to bed Olive so quickly must have been because he only had 48 hours in New York following the Dempsey sparring session because he needed to be back in Pittsburgh to fight another future Dempsey opponent, Tommy Gibbons, in front of 12,000 fans at Forbes Field. This was a rematch after they had fought in May of 1920, a fight that Gibbons gave Greb the licking of his life. According to the Pittsburgh Post over 10 rounds, it was his first loss in two years which had been due to a bad case of diarrhoea after eating green apples, hot dogs and ice cream, although he never used it as an excuse himself. He couldn't face his friend so he disappeared to Conyut Lake and refused to leave. No amount of coaxing would budge him. Week after week he squatted up there swimming in the lake and sulking. The only thing that could get him back was a guarantee that Gibbons would fight him in a rematch. A committee of Pittsburghers met Gibbons, boat that was returning from Ireland, and pleaded, please come over and fight our stubborn boy. Gibbons replied, it'll be a pleasure. I can whip that Pittsburgh Dutchman any time. He signed the contract, and the committee handed it to Greb at Connaught Lake. He jumped for joy, Harry Greb. He ran down the hill to the lake where his sparring partners were, and he yelled, pack the bags, they've got Gibbons for me, and we're going home. Well, their rematch was a completely different story. The Associated Press wrote that Greb fought one of his greatest battles in a furious electrical storm. As the rain poured, Greb was all over Gibbons and manhandled him. Gibbons had trouble getting set for his punches. The conditions actually seemed to favour Greb, the great improviser. Gibbons lost his temper and effectiveness. Well, Greb fought 12 more times after this to end 1920 but his most impressive following the Gibbons annihilation was against Gumboat Smith, when surgeons were summoned to examine Smith when Greb, after a few clinches, landed a hard left on Smith's right eye, injuring the optic nerve and actually blinding him. A second later, he landed a right on Smith's jaw, knocking him out. What a crazy end to a fight. Before the year had ended, Greb had a second set of sparring sessions with Jack Dempsey. In the first session, Greb was the aggressor, while Dempsey tried to work him out, but he was unable to land effective punches, because as reported, Greb was eluding the champion's retaliatory efforts with ease. So on the second day, it was written that Dempsey had his tongue split this time, but he had uh, actually lifted Greb clean off his feet with body punches. However, Dempsey was puffing very hard after boxing Greb. Of course, it was an unusually fast workout, but it seemed to take him longer than it should have to recover his wind, even after such strenuous session. The last day was not as entertaining because it consisted of the lightest kind of boxing, consisting chiefly of fainting and footwork, as, as it was reported. Some suggest that Jack asked Harry to actually lighten up on it on him a little on the last day so that was the end of those last sessions if you like definitely not as effective as the ones before no doubt i'm sure someone did have a chat with harry and tell him to calm down well on new year's eve of 1920 the chicago daily tribune printed the headline greb breaks with manager goes to engel now george engel was actually based in new york city and the article described why greb had dropped mason as his manager now and it is said the trouble between Greb and Mason began last summer when Greb was beaten by Tom Gibbons at Forbes Field where he disappeared in a sulk and the local battler also told friends he was uh, not getting a large enough percentage of the purses to suit him. Well Greb actually signed a two-year deal with the famous New York boxing manager but he would soon find out the grass wasn't greener. Greb was less active in 1921 by his standards but he did still fight 21 times, only five fights in Pittsburgh and would travel to many different cities and even fight in Canada. So from January to May, Greb fought 10 times, winning nine and drawing one, and then began a trilogy of fights with the tough and rugged Chuck Wiggins. And the South Bend News Times stated that going into the 10th round, Greb looked like the sure winner. However, Wiggins rallied in the 10th, causing the News Times to call the fight a controversial draw. As did they do with many fights back in that day. They did, didn't they? Often. Now, they fought again on June 23rd in Indiana, but once again, they could not be split. 
The Terrier Heart of Star gave Greb three rounds, Wiggins two and five even, and they reported that Greb landed more clean blows than Wiggins. However, their Greb win was overruled by the Indianapolis Star, Indianapolis News and Associated Press, who all scored the fight a draw. Now in between their three rough fights, Greb took on Kid Norfolk, who was 89-18-6 in the August. This was a significant fight for Greb, who had to pick himself up off the floor in Pittsburgh after getting thumbed in his right eye, which would eventually lead to him losing sight in that eye. But he did not complain to the referee. While on unsteady legs, he dug in deep and handed Kid Norfolk the beating of his life, taking a newspaper decision. Immediately after the fight, Greb complained of seeing lights of many colours. And back in his dressing room, he swore to secrecy because he didn't want other boxers to know about it, as they would have taken advantage. And then he joked, that black boy's got a tougher eye than I had. Years later, after Greb had passed away, his doctor dropped a bombshell from Atlantic City. In the New York Times, on October the 27th, 1926, Greb's personal physician, Dr. Carl S. McGiven, made the following formal statement. Harry Greb was made blind by a blow on his right eye during a fight with Kid Norfolk, Negro heavyweight in New York City in 1921. His blindness was said to be caused by a retinal tear in the Norfolk fight that would eventually progress to a full retinal detachment. That's very interesting information at this point of the story because what we know now at this point is that he's, from then on, he's, he's partially blind. Yeah, and he's getting those those blurs and a bit like what we when we done Sugar Ray Leonard, he had the same thing happen to him, but operation. Obviously, Greb, well, he was now partially blind in that eye. Not fully at this point, but we'll go into that as, as he goes along and he should have really been resting. But So partially blind in one eye, Greb was back in the ring less than a week later. And this is where he began to actually change his style. I mean, this is clever. It did become a bit a lot dirtier. Yeah. This uh, is actually well documented in the Chuck Wiggins third fight in West Virginia. After the fight, it was written that the fight was a rough house affair from start to finish with a good deal of elbowing, butting with the head, both men being the offenders. I think he's a bit pissed off for the fact that he's, you know, he's getting thumbed. He was a very clean fighter up to that point and he, he does change his style to become a bit nastier. Exactly two weeks after that retinal tear, he was fighting against uh, Joe Cox on September the 20th, which was the beginning of Greb's string of New York fights that would last until November. Following the 12-round decision victory in Coney Island, Greb took a whole month off, probably to give his eye a break and visit his eye physician, Dr. McGiven, who was actually based in Atlantic City and, and possibly received treatment. Greb's windmill style, which was based on consistent movement and his in and out and switching of angles, didn't change that much. So the, the style was pretty much the same because it actually made it easier for his left eye to always see his opponent from different viewpoints. You know, the closer in he was, it was probably going to be difficult. This actually lessened the number of blind spots due to the loss of, of sight or partial sight in his right eye. But as we mentioned, Greb had become a lot more nasty in close quarters. He was he was now, we'll, we'll, as we get further on, you'll hear it more, but the thumbing in the eye, head butting if necessary to try and disable his opponents. And Regis, Regis M. Welsh, from the Pittsburgh Post that she wrote near the end of the year that Greb learned many tricks in New York. Greb has finally hit into the style, which is going to get him a lot of money around Madison Square Garden and other Gotham emporiums. Because Harry, the wild, ferocious, sometimes comical fighter, has finally adopted a style that which makes any fighter look good with him, no matter how far he outclasses him. Well, in other words, he was asked by his new manager to carry fighters for longer rather than embarrassing him over a distance or just landing the knockout punch. If anyone was in any doubt that Harry Greb may have deliberately thrown fights, then you can think again. Greb was his own man who could not be bullied into anything. He didn't want to do that and that also included the gangsters who tried to get him to throw fights. Now, there's one legendary story which explains that best. When one day, a gangster actually handed Harry Greb a roll of $50 bills and told him to drop the decision in his next fight, which was a couple of days away. Now, Greb, 
threw the money in the gangster's face, knocked him down and kicked him all over the street. Only a few feet away, crouched behind a machine gun in a parked car, sat three of the gangster's pals. Greb knew that they were there, and they knew he knew it. They didn't have the bollocks to defend their fellow mafioso, so they actually left in a hurry, leaving their man gasping for breath and bleeding in the gutter. Now, whether you believe that or not, whether it's fact, whether it's fiction, it's a pretty good tale indeed. Now, before the year was done, Greb was in a major fight at Madison Square Garden against Hungarian Charlie Weinart, who had fought many Hall of Famers, such as Gene Tunney, Jack Dillon, Harry Wills and Jack Sharkey. The fight took place on November 4th, 1921, and Greb was said to have been giving up around £25 to his heavyweight opponent. The newspaper's description on the fight said that Greb, for some reason, cut loose with every shady practice known to the ring except kicking. He butted, held on, held with his gloves and rammed his thumbs deep into Weinart's eyes. So as we said earlier, he's starting to adopt this pretty rough and illegal style to get himself through fights. Yeah, well, Harry Greb actually finished the year with four more wins, two by knockout, and began 1922 with some promising events to look forward to. He was actually scheduled to fight Tommy Gibbons again, but this time in an officially judged bout. There was even discussions about finally meeting middleweight champion Johnny Wilson. After three wins in three months, Greb was ready for Gibbons on March 13 at Madison Square Garden. And a confident Greb stated that I'm not afraid, no fighter living has ever scared me. I've fought tougher men than Gibbons and they can't stop me. And I've fought him three times and he couldn't do it. This is the one chance I will have to prove to many that I really am in his class. If condition, confidence and eagerness to do my part has any bearing on the result, then I will win. When in front of 13,400 at the Garden, Greb took a unanimous decision over 15 rounds and the Chicago Daily Tribune wrote, for nearly the entire distance, Gibbons was on the receiving end of the greatest shower of blows he had ever seen in his life. The defeat was as se severe one for Gibbons, who had entertained the hope of one day meeting Jack Dempsey for the championship. He blew his last chance tonight when the Pittsburgher literally picked him to pieces nearly every step of the way. After the fight, Greb would say there were few things a fighter must have besides size, among them being aggressiveness, footwork, cleverness and courage. Then he called out a couple of fighters in particular. He said, bring on George's Carpenter and then Jack Dempsey. The newspapers were saying this victory for Greb was the greatest pugilistic upset in recent years. Following the win over Gibbons, Tom Bodkin, who was a referee and entrepreneur, approached Maurice Kane, manager of the burlesque shows, and told him that Greb would be an added attraction to his fading variety shows. And Kane excitedly asked, How much do you want for Greb? Tommy responded, Thousand a week. Kane then asked, And how much for you, Tommy? 150, he replied. Sold. You open at the Gaty in Pittsburgh next week, said Kane. The deal had been done, but it had been done without Greb's permission. So he tracked him down to his hotel, waited until he returned at six in the morning with two women in tow, and told him what he'd done. How much is Kane paying you, Greb asked. 150, replied Tommy. Okay, Tommy. I'll give you an extra hundred a week out of my thousand. The tour started in Pittsburgh and spanned across ten cities in ten weeks before ending in Montreal after a week in Toronto. While Greb was on his tour, a picture of him was placed on the cover of a brand new boxing magazine entitled The Ring. That victory gave Greb the opportunity to finally fight for a title, but not the middleweight title the light heavyweight championship that was held by none other than Gene Tunney. On May the 23rd, 1922, Greb came in at 162 pounds, 12 pounds less than the American light heavyweight champion Tunney. Under the strain of nine years of savage ring combat, mostly against opponents who outweighed him from 20 to 50 pounds, and the sight in his good eye was getting worse, Greb was threatened that he would be disqualified if he actually roughed up Tunney 
as he had against Gibbons. Well, the fight took place at Madison Square Gardens and it was the first time that Greb had the chance of actually winning a championship title without needing to knock out his opponent. Greb was the three to one favourite, even though he was the challenger. Dempsey was interviewed by a sports writer, Hype Igor, before the big title match and referred to the sparring sessions with Greb. Uh, funniest hitter in the world. He makes you think you're in a glove factory and shelves of them are tumbling down on you. He can slap you to death. I tell you, I found that the best way to get him was at close quarters. Getting close to him, however, isn't the easiest thing in the world. So that was what Jack Dempsey said. And just seconds into the fight and Greb landed a powerful left hook that broke Tunney's nose. And it was going to be a long fight for Gene, who actually reflected on this situation in his autobiography, A Man Must Fight. And this is what he said. He said, Doc Bagley, who, ma who was my chief second, made futile attempts to congeal the nose bleeding by pouring adrenaline into his hand and having me sniff it up my nose. This I did round after round it didn't work as greb was in co complete control until nat flies reported that tunny began to show improvements in the fifth which was uh the first actual even round but greb's constant assault from all angles landed with accuracy on tunny round after round as the fire marine now bled from his nose mouth and cuts from over both eyes the champion was weak from relentless pace that Greb had set and seemed to be getting stronger while Tunney would wipe his forearms with the blood bleeding into his eyes and stumbling into the ropes and desperately trying to keep his tormentor at bay. It wasn't working. Greb was just on fire. The fight ended up being one of the bloodiest and most one-sided championship fights. It was for the American Championship light heavyweight title, not the world, but it was still a huge title. And this was the work that uh, just a, a supply of performance from Harry Greb. The Pittsburgh press row, you must go some to award him, as in Tunney, even one inning of the 15. Perhaps he did earn the third and a portion of the 13th, but Tunney was outclassed both on the outside and inside battling. At the end of the brutal 15th round, Greb helped a bleeding, helpless but spirited Tunney over to his handlers. Staggering doubtfully, Tunney mumbled through his swollen lips, Well, Harry, you were the better man tonight. An unmarked Greb replied, won the championship before he was dragged away. When the verdict of a Greb unanimous decision was announced, his corner lifted him onto their shoulders in wild celebration. After nine long years, hundreds of fights and only one good eye, Greb had actually finally won a title. The legendary promoter Tex Rickard said of Greb, if there was ever a champion, there is one, and as I have helped him to be this chance, I stand willing to give him a crack at the middleweight championship if I can get Wilson in the ring with him. This would be Tunney's first and only defeat of his career and he actually lost almost two quarts of blood during the fight but the beating he was given served its purpose. He said, I discovered through the early part of the fight that I could whip Greb. As each round went by, battered and pummeled from post to post as I was, the discovery gradually became a positive certainty. But before they would rematch, a good friend of Greb's Happy Albacca told a story about someone congratulating Greb on his impressive victory by yelling, He gave the big ape 12 pounds and murdered him. He spotted him half a foot of height. Then Albacca chimed in, Wait, height, hell, he spotted him one eye. Greb was said to have turned and told Happy Albacca to shut up. What the hell are you talking about? Albacca quickly recovered by replying, I was just kidding. Albaca had almost let the cat out of the bag by exposing the secret of Greb's one good eye. He was lucky nobody actually knew what he was talking about, Albaca, and immediately overlooked the comment. Otherwise, Greb would have given him two bad eyes. <laughs> and probably a few more. And well, Albaca then recalled another story, what he referred to as the envelope incident. So handed an envelope George Engel for a short time during one of Greb's squabbles with Red Mason and told to mind it, Mr. Allbacker stuffed it into the inside coat pocket and thought of it no more. The next morning he woke up with a massive hangover to discover the envelope contained $20,000 and that 
underworld figures had every intended intention of getting hold of that money, even if they had to send someone swimming with the fishes. So happy all back. I rem- remembered thinking, and there I was with my belly full of tiger piddle and them hoodlums looking for a big frame like mine to drill some holes through. When I moaned to Greb about it, his reaction made everything right. You didn't get shot, did ya? So what you come worrying about, Grandma? <laughs> Just another demonstration of Greb's lack of fear inside and outside the ring, whether it be dealing with gangsters or skeezers way but much bigger than he was in the ring, and, and the guy just basically had balls of steel. Greb returned home to see his wife, Mildred, who was actually unable to attend the fight due to illness. She was then diagnosed by the doctor to have tuberculosis, at which point she went to uh, Sanarak Lake, one of the premier places to treat t- tuberculosis at the turn of the century because of its fresh air and serenity. And Mildred uh, was actually given a 50% chance of surviving and a 50% chance of dying within five years. Greb fought on and he fought and won six more fights to end 1922 with one significant fight against a guy called Captain Bob Roper in New York on November 10. Now, Greb actually took the official decision over the scheduled 12 rounds and newspapers noted that Roper was booed from the start to finish by the packed house. Many believe it was this fight or during this fight that Greb completely lost full sight in his right eye after Roper thumbed him in the tenth. This time it wasn't so easy to hide his eye problems because the usually active Greb, well, he had to take an unprecedented two months off after the Roper fight. On November the 25th, the Washington Post wrote, Harry Greb, the Pittsburgh Flash, came to town with patches over two sore eyes, but full of fight. Greb was admitted to hospital for a week with patches over both eyes, not knowing if he would be permanently blind or not. Then he was told there was nothing that the doctors could do for him and that he would be completely sightless in his right eye. Now after some rest, Greb was about a month away from returning to the ring and his two-year contract was now up with George Engel. Greb was asked about this by a newspaper and his response was a simple one. I'd like to do my own business for a while, but in time, we'll take on another handler. Before the January 1923 bout with Bob Roper, Greb was caught up in an altercation outside the ring when he came to the rescue of his stablemate at a bar in Youngstown. The bantamweight was just a kid who decided to stop off for a drink after he was beaten the night before. And while minding his own business at the end of the bar, an enormous man who was twice his size saw his busted nose and asked, So you're a pug? Before punching the innocent kid in the mouth, ripping out seven stitches the doctor had sewn on the inside following his fight. Now witnessing this unprovoked attack, a patron managed to stop any further damage while the bartender offered the kid some sympathy. The bartender told him, That guy is a son of a bitch. This ain't the first time he has socked decent people at my bar. I got some boys who could take care of him, but his old gent runs this town. I gotta lay off, otherwise I get closed up. The kid replied, I can do something about it if you can hold him here for a few hours until I get reinforcements. So the bartender was more than willing to accept any assistance with this no good piece of shit. So he promised to detain him before warning that you'd better get classy reinforcements because this bird is a madman when he's drinking. He's a professional football player and tough as hell and knows how to handle himself in the clinches. After putting through a long distance call, the kid told his story to, of course, Harry Greb. And about two hours later, he arrived at the bar and met up with his stable mate, handed him a roll of tape and told him, bandage my hands, kid. He then took a closer look at his bleeding mouth and asked, is that the bastard down there? Swell. Okay, kid. Pull the tape tight. We'll take care of that mouth soon, as soon as we get out of here. This is the story, of course, from James R. Fair, the author of uh, Given to the Angels. So this is the to, to the rest of the story here. And it's a little pug told him what the bartender had said about the bruiser being tough. Greb gave him one of those, so what's the difference look? 
There were a lot of people at the bar now and several cops were standing outside. The bartender had been phoning friends for two hours. Before Greb set out to avenge his little pal, he wanted to know how many other men uh, he would have to slough. Not that it mattered because there was a chair within reach and he knew how to use it if he ran into more trouble than he can handle with his fists. But he was meticulous at odds of moments like this and wanted to know what the score was. Those guys or those other guys, the little pugs said, will move away when you move in. So Greb and his stable mate, they strode down the bar and as the bartender had promised, everybody moved away from the bruiser. The latter put his hands up, but before he could use them, Greb drove a left and a right into the mouth. Well, the big man went down. He outweighed Greb by 70 pounds, and there was a gap in his mouth where pearly white teeth had been there before that punch landed. He jumped up and tried to hold. Greb thumbed him in the eye, blasted him with both hands under the heart, and puke poured out of his mouth. Greb rushed him into the wall bouncing his left knee off his groin en route. Then he held him with one hand while he rattled his head against the plaster with short, vicious chops to the chin with the other. Greb stepped back. The big man fell face down in his own puke. His eyes closed, blood oozing out of his twisted, torn and semi-toothless mouth. This time someone yelled, 47 seconds. The cops came in smiling and said it was clever work. Leaving, Greb put his arm around his little stable mate. Your mother's not here to look after you, he said with a touch of big brother irritation. So I gotta do it. Mother couldn't do better, the youthful pug said. Know what, Greb asked. This'll cost you two girls. Know any here in Youngstown? Just a minute, the little pug said. He went back to the cops, who were cleaning up the bruiser, holding smelling salts under his nose and saying, it was too bad they hadn't been there when he was so brutally set upon and they gave him a half a dozen addresses. Holy Toledo, Greb yelled. We ain't got time to go to all of them places. Our train leaves in 45 minutes. How about my mouth, the little pug asked. Open, Greb said. The little pug opened his mouth, and Greb peered into it. It's much better than when I first saw it. We'll take care of it in Pittsburgh. Dr. Deesk will fix you up. Come on, let's go. He went to two houses, and he had a wonderful time. And what a great story that is about Harry Greb literally <laughs> punching the shit out of a guy much bigger than him. And the moral of the story is Harry Greb gets two girls at the end of it. He's absolute legendary, isn't he? My goodness me. I mean, the truth is that there's loads of witnesses and it does seem to be quite plausible. I, I wouldn't, I absolutely wouldn't put it beyond Greb doing what he did there. And so after coming to the rescue of his friend, his wife, well, was battling tuberculosis, a current and he was a current free agent, officially blind now in one eye. Harry Greb had set his sights on revenge against Bob Roper. So on January 1st, 1923, Roper fought dirty throughout, so much so that after the fight, he had to be accompanied by the police to his dressing room because the crowd were going to attack him for such a terrible display of dirty tactics. So I dread to think how dirty he was because Greb was quite dirty at this point himself. Greb was actually finally declared the winner once the brawl had finished, but not without some consequences because Roper and Greb were actually suspended by the Boxing Commission until they could explain why the rules of the organisation were disregarded in the bout. Well, Greb was obviously, you know, he was reinstated a week later after his explanation of retaliation was sufficient for the commission. So Ring Magazine in its first full year of publication, actually announced its year-end results. The Fighter of the Year award went to Harry Greb, and his win over Gene Tunney was given the Fighter of the Year. Now, by the end of January, Greb officially signed with Red Mason once again. After the Roper win, Greb clocked up five straight wins. The two wins over Tommy Logram were the most significant, with the first being his or their second fight being his his first successive successful defense of that american light heavyweight title his second defense came against gene tunney on february the 23rd 1923 at madison square garden in new york the receipts of this fight actually total 40 uh, just over forty-seven thousand, with greb receiving 37 and a half percent of the receipts which was set just over 17 near on eighteen thousand dollars and tunney collecting 12 and a half percent which is just shy of six thousand dollars 
as stipulated by the New York Times. Now, the one major difference in the rematch was that Greb's corner man, Billy Gibson, had left and actually teamed up with Tunney as his new manager. And just days before the fight was to take place, Gibson actually tried to put Greb on defensive by petitioning to the State Athletic Commission. And uh, this is what he said. He said, have they, the, the commission need to have a strict watch placed on Harry Greb. Points should be deducted for a foul, even though it is unintentional and not of serious enough nature to warrant disqualification. He was basically just wanted to keep the, the, the commission, have eyes on Greb and sort of make sure the rough stuff don't come into play. Well, he obviously knew Greb very well and he knew what Greb was up to in the ring because he was in his corner. So he, he wanted to make sure his man who he was with now had a better opportunity to, to win back that American light heavyweight title. Now, Greb's manager, Red Mason, accused Tunney's camp of trying to intimidate the New York officials into an anti-Greb bias. The crowd favoured Tunney as the hometown boy from Greenwich Village, while Greb was said to have entered the fight a marked man. Greb weighed 165 and a half pounds, while Tunney 174 pounds. Throughout the fight, it was evident that the referee Patsy Haley was making it hard for Greb, while in close quarters by breaking them frequently and warning Greb several times. Nat Fleischer wrote about the fight in 1931, and he wrote it was a spectacular affair that had 15,000 persons, a packed house, at a high pitch of excitement from start to finish. The Marine carried off the unanimous decision after one of the stormiest ring encounters seen in the garden since boxing was revived in New York. Pandemonium reigned when the decision was announced by Joe Humphreys and for a time the police were kept busy suppressing riots in various parts of the arena. Greb himself explained how both fighters were boxing rough and he said, according to the referee Patsy Haley, I was fouling Tunney all the way through when as a matter of fact Tunney was hitting Milo in nearly every round. Gene Tunney said, realising there was some justice in Greb's claim of a bad decision, I offered him a return engagement. 19 of 23 ringside opinions listed also believe Greb should have not left the ring without his crown. The New York Times wrote that Chairman Wilson Muldoon of the State Athletic Commission was one of the prominent spectators at the battle who differed with the verdict. Muldoon declared that after the bout that he thought Greb was entitled to the decision and reiterated this at the Commissioner's headquarters. The decision in Tunney's favour was unjustifiable. In my opinion, I thought Greb should have received the decision after his determined fight. But that's only my personal opinion. Well, there you go. Following the controversial defeat, Greb made plans to have another bout with Tommy Gibbons before the third meeting with Tunney. But it had been called off on March the 7th because Mildred became ill. And as reported in the papers, is not expected to live many days after contracting pneumonia. So Greb obviously stayed by his wife's side for a month while her condition worsened, taking care of her and obviously looking after his daughter until she sadly passed away at home on March 18, 1923. Greb was left to take care of his three-year-old daughter, Dorothy, but fortunately his sister Ada and her husband would help raise her along with Mildred's mother and her brother, George Riley. Now, following the loss of his wife, Greb understandably never fought again until June 1923. And that was in a layup fight before he finally got a crack at the middleweight champion, Johnny Wilson, who had refused to face Greb, even though he had been the number one contender for his title for a good two years, probably two to three years. I mean, he, he was he should have fought for that middleweight title a long, long time ago. He should have, he should have had it. Wilson was... Uh, even barred from fighting in most states because of his refusal to fight Greb and the rumour was that Wilson was helped of course by gangsters they had helped get some easy opponents for Wilson and may have rigged some questionable fights while they were able to collect some money on the side the last thing their associates or the associates of Wilson wanted to do was to lose their gravy train but Tex Rickard was keen to get the fight made Greb moved permanently to Lake Connaught where he built a house with an outdoor boxing ring a new training facility 
was where he trained with his potential up and coming fight against Johnny Wilson while pre preparing for an uh, activity fight in May against Jimmy Darcy. Greb actually cut his arm, thought nothing of it and continued to train, but it gets worse. His arm then became very painful. He was told by his doctor to go to the hospital fearing an infection and was told after further investigation that he had blood poisoning and will lose his right arm if he doesn't have an operation. Worried that he would lose his right arm, Greb went through with the major operation that would determine his boxing future. Thankfully, the surgery was a complete success and he was finally able to fight for a world title. However, Greb had to trick Wilson and his associates to sign the contract from Tex Rickard. The great sports writer and Ring magazine editor Stanley Weston decades later wrote that Greb supposedly travelled to New York just to trick Wilson into thinking he was out of shape. Now Weston tells the story this way and it reads, Enlisting the aid of some New York bartenders, all of whom liked him, Harry spent hours drinking coloured water and acting like a drunk. The news got around that he was training as usual and finally reached the ears of Wilson. Johnny said to his manager, Now that's the time for me to fight that bum. The only time. So Wilson signed the contract to fight Greb because he thought Greb was so out of shape. He'll be carted out of that ring in a stretcher, he said. The general belief was that Wilson and his gangster associates had put the fix in and that Greb not only had to win, but dominate just in case one or all of the judges had been bided to favour Wilson if the rounds were close. Yeah, and then on, on July 6th, uh, a month before the fight, the Washington Post wrote an article on how Greb ended up in jail and injured. It's quite funny how this happens, considering, well, that you know, we, we've do this sort of gangsters appearing now. So Harry was with his three-year-old daughter and sister, Mrs. Edwards, her husband and Miss uh, Helen Austin in his car. He was stopped by a Cornellsville giant policeman. His name was Andy Thomas for violating the traffic rule. He was taken to jail and according to Harry's story, was beaten by Thomas and another copper who had forced him into the cell. Their blows, according to Greb, opened their wound left from the operation performed for his infected arm several weeks ago. And the article actually went on to describe how when Greb was finally released and the, the fighting continued, apparently this is what he said. He said when Harry was released he made a rush at thomas and uh, with a smash on the jaw dazed the officer greb was greb and the policeman that policeman actually had to be separated as well so they weren't happy this bout though with wilson was finally scheduled for 15 rounds at new york's polo grounds it actually took place on the night of august 31st 1923 regis welsh of the pittsburgh post reported that greb did not fight his usual Siconic style, evidently fearing disqualification. He boxed an orthodox style. Wilson punched mainly for the body, winning the 10th, 14th, and 15th rounds. Greb took all the others, uh, with the 8th being his best round. Greb won beyond argument, even though he uh, fought flat footed. He was too quick and busy for the plodding Wilson. Nevertheless, it was not of Harry's showing so it wasn't a great performance from greb but greb pretty much still won almost every single round the official announcement was inevitable he was the new world middleweight champion for the first time which is incredible his dream had finally been achieved he was the third middleweight champion from his home state pennsylvania after frank claus and george chip greb spoke with the new york times at his hotel after capturing the world title and he said i think i showed everybody who saw the bout that I am Wilson's master. Now, any middleweight in the world can have a crack at the title. I don't intend to remain idle. If Wilson wants a return bout and a promoter will arrange the match, I am agreeable. I am sorry that there were reports that I had agreed to any arrangement, but the bout proved them to be false. My record speaks for itself. Just like when Greb had beaten Tommy Gibbons, theatre companies were now bombarding him with contracts for him to appear on stage. Greb accepted and went on a four full week tour of theatre performances around the country. Harry Greb's reign as middleweight champion lasted from 1923 until 1926 and he also acquired many nicknames during that time such as the wildest tiger, 
the Iron City Express, King of the Alley Fighters, the Human Rubber Ball, the Pittsburgh Wildcat, and the Perpetual Motion Machine. But the one he is best known for is the Pittsburgh Windmill. Now all these nicknames were attempts to describe what he was like in the ring and how he had defended his title. On October the 11th, 1923, Greb fell to a shock defeat against Tommy Loughran in Boston. However, the title was not on the line and the decision was controversial. The Pittsburgh Post said it was a close fight and Loughran had won the first two rounds, concentrating on body attacks. Greb then dominated the next five rounds. Loughran then came back to win the last three, landing the cleaner punches. However, the Boston Globe said that the majority thought Greb had won handily, although Loughran got the decision. But he was guilty of rough tactics while Tommy was landing the cleaner bows. Luckily for him, his title wasn't on the line. No, that's handy. Uh, and the following month, Greb faced Chuck Wiggins uh, for a ninth time, uh, believe it or not, at Grand Rapids in Michigan. So just hours before they were due to fight at Grand Rapids, Greb called into his old pal Chuck Wiggins' his hotel room and said, Hello, Chuck, old pal. You looking in the pink? Say, kid. There's no use in us killing each other like we've been doing. What you say, we make it nice and clean fight tonight. No rough stuff. Well, Wiggins, who was just as much of a fan of the whiskey as Greb was of the women, was in a cheerful mood and replied, Hello, Harry, old sock. You're looking good yourself. I can properly state with reference to tonight's engagement that you have took the words right out of my mouth. We made a lot of cabbage fighting each other and we will make more. We won't pull our punches tonight, but we will make it nice and clean fight like you say. Shake. And they shook on it. And the fight was going according to plan. We've both been very gentlemanly uh, at the end of each round. They actually complimented each other as it work. That was until the fourth round. And for some reason, Chuck Wiggins decided to double cross Greb and from the moment the bell sounded, he pounced in in a scheming manner. So he came running in at him, basically, uh, realizing Wiggins was making his move. Greb, as quick as he was, stuck out his foot, tripped him up, and Wiggins fell head first through the ropes. And uh, his big ass actually got caught between the ropes. <laughs> but as Wiggins actually tried to ease himself backwards through the ropes, he actually <laughs> exposed himself briefly. So Greb, of course, seized his opportunity and whacked him several times in the ass to the amusement of the paying customers. Wiggins finally got his ass out of the ropes and managed to continue the fight in a more gentlemanly manner, which lasted the full six rounds. And that's what you get for trying to double cross your good old pal, Harry Greb. You get your ass beaten, <laughs> literally. He actually got his ass beaten, which I thought was a, a brilliant story. Well, afterwards, Wiggins complained of bells ringing in his head and Greb's faith in humanity had suffered an irreversible blow. And he said, I will never again trust a man who tells me I can properly state that you have took the words right out of my mouth. But in all fairness to Chuck, I can properly state that he is the best butter I have ever butted against. Now, after that rough fight against Wiggins, a third 15-round bout against Gene Tunney was scheduled for December the 10th, 1923. Once again, it was at Madison Square Garden. But there was no controversy leading up to the fight and the judges and referee were all changed. Greb put on some extra weight for this bout and he weighed in at 171.5 pounds while Tunney was at 175 pounds. Tunney again focused on Greb's body but at times during the fight Greb's tactics bewildered the champion but it didn't stop Tunney's steady body fire. Greb's best round was the 15th when he unleashed a furious attack that threatened for a moment to topple the champion. Setting a terrific pace in the closing round, Greb pummeled Tony on his head and the body jarring the champion to his heels with several smashes. However, it happened too late in the fight and Tony was awarded a unanimous decision. Most of the critics awarded nine rounds to Tony, four rounds to Greb and had two rounds even. Regis M. Welsh again of the Pittsburgh Post wrote, Tunney, his eye cut, his mouth and nose bleeding, wind blown and tired, climbed out of the ring amidst loud hooting, while Greb, who won admiration by his clean, earnest and ever-aggressive fighting, stood silently for a few seconds after greeting Tunney and listened to the jeering which boomed against the rafters as the prejudice of the local judges and referee B. 
became an established fact, instead of a myth or a dream, or even a mistake. So after three battles between these two, most believed each fighter had won one bout with the other bout being a draw. Uh, because there were no knockdowns in any of the fights and people were still not convinced which fighter was better at light heavyweight, Tunney needed a more decisive victory against Greb to settle any unanswered questions. So a fourth bout was scheduled a year later. But before that, Greb gained revenge against Tommy Lockman two weeks, two weeks after fighting that third Tunney battle. I mean, this guy is crazy. It was conclusive enough for many onlookers who left the Motor Square Garden in Pittsburgh fearing that Greb was not quite the fire he had once been. Probably because he fought Tunney just two weeks before. But, I mean, you must suspect that Greb's desire may have begun to diminish. You know, he's lost his wife. He's blinded with the accumulation of hundreds of fights and training schedule that had reduced considerably may have resulted in some low-key performances. Now, his training by this point consisted of punching the small bag a couple of minutes for rhythm, skipping rope, playing a sizzling game of handball, and maybe boxing two or three rounds. This occupied 20 minutes of his time, apparently, which he considered to be a sheer waste. Then uh, he would literally yank out a huge address book and thumb through it for the hottest telephone numbers in whatever city. He was going to box. That was how he was training at the time, but he was active. I mean, you don't really need to train when you're as active as he was. But as we've continued to mention, look, Greb loved the opposite sex. He was, of course, devastated to lose his wife, the love of his life, the mother of his child. But he was never going to be faithful or the faithful type. Now, following Mildred's passing, after he sort of, I say, you don't get over these things, but you, you come to terms with them. His desire, his desire for women probably increased more than ever. And it did. A lot of people say that. And according to close friends, Greb had the most unique way of warming up before his fights. Now, he would actually sneak girls into his dressing rooms. He'd lock the door, give them a C and two while his opponent waited in the ring. Then he would enter the ring warm and enthusiastic as ever and turn on a sublime performance. Maybe the Tommy Lothram performance was due to the fact that he didn't get two women or even one woman. And any six minutes before the fight. (laughs) Well, they always say it relaxes you too much, doesn't it? Like having sex before a fight. That's why they say you need to abstain from it. The fact that he's literally making his opponent wait in the ring. Well, that says a lot about his uh, sexual prowess, doesn't it? If he's taking a few minutes to then give a a woman a good scene to, and then he's getting into the ring. (laughs) So exactly, (laughs) I think that tells you all you need to know about (laughs) Harry Greb's sexual prowess. Greb made the second defence of his middleweight title in 1924 of January against Johnny Wilson after successfully making his first defence against Brian Downey just before the third Tony meeting. During that fight, Downey became rough and attempted to use some of the dirty tactics he had learned during his career. Because Downey was getting away with it, Greb realised it was okay to use some himself. He then taught Downey a lesson or ten. The next day, the post explained that Greb, outfought, outpunched, out-generated and out-roughed Brian Downey. Greb's second official title defence was a rematch against Wilson in a fight that was scheduled for 15 rounds at Madison Square Garden. It was a close fight that Greb deserved, but his speed was clearly diminishing. Although he fought a very clean fight, the press reported that he had conformed to every rule fighting cleaner ever than he even did with Tony. The following month, Greb went on a seven-week summer holiday to California with his manager, Red Mason, and his trainer slash sparring partner, Leo Cargill. And while he was there, he defeated Jack Reeves. When they returned, a reporter who covered the Kid Norfolk fight that ended in Greb getting disqualified in April 1924 wrote, They tossed pot bottles, clubs, rocks, and pig iron at Harry Greb as he left the ring last night. Maybe if Harry had kept his thumb out of his opponent's eyes long enough to let him get his bearings, it would have been a different story. Other reports actually contradict this writing by saying when Norfolk finally left the ring, he was met with menacing hoots from the crowd, while Greb actually left the ring with a great send-off, which consisted of mingled hoots and cheers. Well, whoever the real villain was that night, it doesn't matter because many have said Greb was not bitter towards Norfolk for being the reason for the blindness in one eye, but he clearly enjoyed himself that night and he got a bit of revenge, didn't he? I mean, he thumbed him in the eye, got him back a little bit. He would continue to use a very dirty trick, all the dirty tricks in the book, 
from uh, this point forward. I mean, he already is, but it gets even worse. And thumbing his opponents in the eyes, punishing them or pushing them to their knees while in clinches, deliberately stepping on their feet. This usual, you know, the usual stuff. And, and I mean, the, the explanation and one of the most famous quotes for his rough tactics in the rings from Harry Greb himself was prize fighting ain't the noblest of arts and I ain't its noblest artists. So, you know, quite simply, he didn't really care. He wasn't at this point. Why not? <laughs> Greb had made an official title defense of his middleweight title on June 26, 1924 at the Yankee Stadium in New York, the headliner for a charity shows in age of the Milk Fund. Greb actually took on Ted Moore in a 15-round fight in front of a packed stadium of 50,000. I think that's his largest attendance of fans. Actually raised 150,000, sorry, for the Milk Fund. But of course, it wasn't just uh, Harry on that bill. Other bouts uh, also included Gene Tunney against Ermino Spala and Young Stribling, another terrific young fighter against Tommy Loughran. Greb took home 75,000 in a disappointed performance once again due to taking off 13 and a half pounds in just 10 days. And uh, he did not fight at his accustomed, accustomed speed or with his accustomed speed. Even still, he won 13 of the 15 rounds and was pulled up by the referee for consistent fouls. Greb's next fight was on August 21st, 1924 in Fremont, Ohio. It was a 10-round bout and it was against another remarkable fighter in Tiger Flowers, who at the time was 69-8-4. Harry Budbury wrote that wrote about the fight, the headline on the fight for the Lehman News that titled Master Boxer finds, excuse the expression, but Nego quick as a cat. Well, Harry Bradbury's description explains where these two fighters were in their respective careers. And he wrote, Harry Greb, Master Boxer, found in Tiger Flowers, perhaps the most difficult proposition in all his ring experiences. The black fellow certainly made good every claim as to prowess coupled with uncanny skill. It would be unfair, unreasonable unju and unjust to give a decision otherwise than a draw. Greb, with all his wonderful ability, which has proven superior to any of the other middleweights, coupled that skill with cunning and long apprenticeship without avail. It was a battle in which the teacher found his equal. It was not a spectacular battle, but one wonderfully interesting to the devotee learned in the higher branches of the art of self-defence. It was a battle of defence rather than offence. For every legitimate blow, which would have caused considerable damage, was blocked skilfully by one or the other. It continued through ten rounds, without a single bit of injury to either, and still every round was fought with a determination to win. Greb took the newspaper decision, but his reign at the top was beginning to fade. Before the year was out, Greb faced Gene Tunney for a fourth time at the Olympic Arena in Cleveland, Ohio, in a ten-rounder, on September the 17th, 1924. The New York Times wrote the next day that they thought they fought at a furious pace, that neither was damaged, and they also wrote that Tony left the ring with a slight cut on his forehead. Another newspaper wrote that after the fight, Tony had a cut above the right eye, and that Greb was bleeding from the mouth, where several hard lefters nailed him. The result in most of the newspapers was that the fight was an obvious draw, and the Washington Post had a headline which read, Greb and Tunney go 10 rounds to a draw. The article made it clear that the two boxers fought 10 rounds on fairly even terms here, according to a majority of the newspaper experts at ringside. And the New York Times headline was Tunney and Greb drew in 10 rounds. In the article, they described how Greb was outweighed by 10 pounds, was the aggressor, and Tunney countered with uh, good body attacks. With four fights completed, many believed the tally was one win to Greb, one win to Tunney, and two drawn fights. These exciting fights left people wanting more. So six months later, a fifth and final bout was scheduled for March 17, 1925. However, a couple of weeks before the fight, Greb was driving in Pittsburgh one night out with two women in his car. Of course, always two women. When five men held up Greb and his two female companions. The crooks stole a ring and $95. The incident was actually reported in the Washington Post with the headline, 
Harry Greb in fight with five bandits. The article then described how Greb reported the robbery immediately, and when the police went back to the scene of the crime, the police found a road spattered, splattered with blood as a result of the punishment inflicted upon the highwaymen. Greb had beaten up all five of the rub- robbers who actually attacked him. The Greb Tony fight, well, that had to be rescheduled due to injuries that Greb had received while beating up his attackers, but only by a mere 10 days. It actually got postponed to March 27. <laughs> I just didn't give a shit, did he? He'd take on anybody. It didn't matter what they had. He, he was just willing to take them on. And it certainly sounds like, uh, whether it's true or whether it's a myth, it certainly sounds like uh, maybe something went on a little bit more than what we thought it did that night. Well, back to the fight, and that fight took place at the auditorium in St. Paul, Minnesota, in front of a crowd of around 9,000. But the fight was the least entertaining. In the newspapers the next day, it was described as a lacklustre bout and declared Tunney the winner. The Chicago Daily Tribune summed it up best with their headline that read, Tunney shades Greb in sleepy bout at St. Paul. The headline in the New York Times simply said, Tunney beats Greb in St. Paul battle. There were no arguments with the result. Even Greb told the referee George Barton in his dressing room after the fight, that's the last time I'll fight this guy. He's getting too big and too strong for me to handle. I could lick him at one time, but not anymore. Tunney is really getting good. Now from January to June 5th, 1925, Greb fought exactly 14 fights, winning all but one against Gene Tunney and was now ready to make his fourth defence of the middleweight title against the welterweight champion, Mickey Walker. Now, Cuddy DeMarco was one of Greb's stablemates who fought predominantly at junior lightweight and was down for an engagement with Tony Ross in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a couple of weeks before Greb was to leave for New York to start training for the Mickey Walker bout in 1925. Now, they bumped into each other on Broadway and 43rd Street in Manhattan, and DeMarco, known to be a bit camp, asked Greb, Listen, darling, How's about you running up to Johnstown and seconding me against Tony Ross tomorrow evening? Then I'll go to New York with you and help you get ready for Walker. Greb accepted by saying, OK, Squirt. So while in the dressing room, the promoter walked in and told DeMarco the bad news that his opponent had pulled out and that he never had a replacement. So the fight was off and he would now lose $1,500. So thinking on his feet, DeMarco asked Greb for another favour. Darling. Let's you and me put on an exhibition. You're going to work with Mickey Walker in a couple of weeks. You've been getting a lot of publicity and now's the time to cash in on it. And at the same time, save 1,500 potatoes for me. Make some for yourself. Would you say, sweetheart? The fans will eat you, eat it up and you're the champ. So Greg was always willing to earn some green obviously extra green and he accepted smartest idea you ever had i need to limber up in a way i'm beginning to believe some of them stories i have heard about he'd been hearing about you being a being brilliant you sure are brilliant so the promoter gave the news to the crowd about the fight being cancelled and obviously harry greb would now step in as a replacement for exhibition now all happy and they began singing greb's name in fact now before they entered the ring Greb, obviously, he didn't bring his gym gear, so he had to squeeze into a pair of DeMarco shorts because, as I say, he left his kit. And he told his stable mate to don't move me around too fast because I might burst out of these for sure as hell. I'll be pinched for showing my can. Mr. DeMarco joked, it won't be the first time you've been pinched and for less reason. Besides, don't worry, I'm going to imitate the slow train through Arkansas tonight. But as the bell sounded, DeMarco charged at his larger foe and landed a big shot on Greb's chin, sending him unexpectedly to the canvas. Dazed, but with all his faculties, Greb jumped up to his feet and held onto his smaller opponent. Then, or when he's, his senses returned, he called DeMarco a little what bastard. What's the idea of socking me like that? <laughs> well, DiMarco yelled to the referee to protect him and backed up, talking. And this is what he said. You're big lug. You've been pasting my ears off in the gym for years and having a lot of fun. And there wasn't nobody to stop you. But there are plenty of people out there and I'm going to shellack you. And if you slug me, they'll mob you. 
Knowing that he couldn't knock him out in front of the crowd, Greb grabbed him. Now I'm going to fix your wagon, you what bastard. This is where DeMarco discovered the nasty side of Greb's in-ring tactics. He racked his open glove down over DeMarco's battered features, ripping off chunks of skin and repeated this procedure as often as he could get inside a clinch while smirking. He was killing DeMarco, who did the best he could in these painful embraces, but he got bit, kicked, butted and racked throughout. As they headed back to the dressing room, Greb was in hot pursuit of Mr. DeMarco and close to busting out of his boxing trunks at the same time. By the smarts, DeMarco grabbed a dozen policemen and convinced them to protect him. Greb was furious and eager to rip his head off, but then he realised that DeMarco had his train ticket for New York in his pocket and that his train was due imminently. Greb had an appointment the next morning with his promoter of his fight with Walker, Humbert Fugese, and there was no other train that would get him to New York on time to keep this appointment, and he never missed appointments, especially when there was money involved. So Greb changed his tune and tried to convince DeMarco that he wouldn't hurt him. It took him a while, but he managed to sway the little shit in the end. <laughs> Interesting, they shared a cabin together back to New York, and DeMarco did actually did wonders to help Greb, Greb get prepared for Walker, although they never ever sparred, or he or DeMarco never sparred Greb unless there was a, a big crowd just in case that Greb took a, uh, his revenge on him. Greb trained harder for the Walker fight than in any of his other fights in his career, as many have suggested, but it wasn't plain sailing by any means. To assist him, among others, the double crosser, DeMarco, and Patsy Scanlon, two very capable little men. Originally, Greb had planned to train at Madame Sick Keys Bay at Summit, New Jersey, but he changed his mind when he realized that was Walker's stamp stumping ground. So he decided to camp up at Manhasset, Long Island, where he could enjoy the nightlife in New York with many of the ladies of the night and be back in camp before breakfast in the morning. This had always been his routine, probably since sort of a year after his wife, and no one was going to tell him any different. He ran a few miles, he sparred for eight or ten rounds daily, always using food or good food, fresh food, sparring partners as well, and the perfect pre preparation for Mickey Walker, who was, of course, the welterweight champion of the world at the time. And Greb was known for his speed, and he trained to enhance his speed. Obviously, we knew his speed was fading, but he did everything he could to try and get something back. On occasions, his sparring partners would actually gang up on him after he had ruffled up, ruffled a few feathers needlessly, as he would do, and they would end up rioting in the ring. <laughs> but after those heated sessions, he would forgive and forget. Even with all the hard work he had put in, he had lost practically none of his ex excess weight a week before the fight. Because obviously he was fighting at 170 when he fought Tunney. So what he did he do? He quit eating and went on a liquid diet. Well, on the night before the fight, Greb was the 7-5 to favourite. But the night before at 2am, Greb was spotted by Murray Lewin, a fight writer and a group of the biggest gamblers in the country, Arnold Rothstein, Sam Boston, his brother Mayer, Mike Best and Frankie Marlowe stumbling outside of Lindy's restaurant on Broadway. A cab pulled up to collect a pissed up Greb who was seen waving at the gamblers and then collapsing. Of course, two girls were with him and they helped him back to his feet and into the cab. The gamblers looked at each other in shock and Rothstein said, that's what we're betting on, hey? They phoned all over the country, betting everything they had on Walker, which slashed the odds. Gene Tunney visited his old foe in the morning before the fight and was shocked at what he saw. Greb was gone, weak, trembling and had a slight temperature. Tunney didn't let on to Greb how shocked he was. Instead, he whipped out a bottle of champagne and said, drink this, Harry, it'll relax you. Greb drank up. Then Tunney advised him, it's your title that will be on the line tonight, Harry, so make Walker enter the ring ahead of you. With that recommendation, Greb went for a run in Central Park to make sure he was going to make weight an hour later at the New York State Athletic Commission offices. Now, after amazingly making the weight, he ate his first decent meal in 10 days, which gave him a lift, but he was awfully tired and he had still had a temperature. 
After a rub down in his hotel room, a little kip and then a walk, he felt better. So he headed off to the polo grounds early to watch the undercard. Now, while consoling one of the younger boxers, Jimmy Slattery, after he was knocked out, Herbert Faguzi, or Fagazi, promoter of the fight, he rushed in and he told Greb that Harry Wills, who was also on the undercard, refused to go on unless he was given the main event billing. Well, Greb was pissed. So he jumped up, raced down to Wills' dressing room and shouted in the odds saying, you big tramp, I'll fight you right here in this dressing room and the winner will get the main bout. Fagazi was holding Greb back when the Boxing Commission came in and ruled that Wills had to go on next. Rather than take on Greb and the Commission, Wills made his way out of the dressing room and some say he left in a bit of a hurry. After that eventful moment with Greb, clearly in kill mode, he entered the ring second, as Tunney suggested. He was pale, his face was drawn and he still had a temperature. Not only had the weight been an issue for the 31-year-old Harry Greb, but fighting just under 300 fights must have also taken its toll on his body. And plus the added mix of fighting one of the greatest welterweights that ever lived in the peak of his career was actually eight years younger. Many in boxing edge towards Walker. The slower and older Greb fought hard in the first five rounds. And the second was a sensational, one of the greatest of all time, explained Bratland Rice of the New York Herald Tribune. James Fair described how Greb was feeling after those first five brutal rounds. He said, as he, as in Greb, went to his corner at the end of the fifth, his body a mass with red welts and bruises, there were shouts of stop it. His handlers worked over him, sneaking a slug of brandy rubbing his aching legs massaging his limp arms he didn't look like a champion now but you knew about his heart and knowing about about it you didn't count him out you winced as you contemplated what walker would do to him in the next round the sixth well the brandy must have worked because greb came out in the sixth round full of energy and showing excellent movement and speed like in his younger days The seventh was going the same way as the round before, but this time referee Eddie Purdy got too close to the action and ended up on the deck. Walker jumped over him and Greb evaded him, chasing Walker. The bell ended the seventh as Purdy got up and limped over, holding the ropes. Mr Albacher hollered, The bell saved the referee! Well, to his credit, Purdy continued but was visibly limping as the eighth opened. Greb was getting annoyed with Purdy, even before he injured himself, fearing that he was favouring Walker in the clinches between rounds. Greb said, That meddlesome cop had better keep his hands off me. So at the end of the 10th, Humbert Fugazi told Greb to lay off Purdy or he'll throw you out of the ring. Greb replied with a classic one-liner and he said, If he don't lay off me, I'll stuff him down Walker's throat. Neither Greb nor Walker had gone down in the fight, but Purdy found himself down again this time in the 11th, which compelled a reporter sitting ringside to say, the Iron City Express is steaming tonight. They say he doesn't like referees. Greb was looking comfortable in the 14th, but was staggered twice, although halfway through it, he bullied Walker to the ropes and stuck a thumb in Mickey's right eye. Walker whined, you Dutch rat, and Greb landed a right hook squarely on his chin, which made his legs go rubbery, but managed to keep himself upright and finished the round. Greb bullied an injured Walker in the 15th and final round, in a fight that will be remembered as one of the roughest in ring history. So Walker's mouth was torn and gushing blood, his ear was ripped, his eye was badly swollen. Greb, on the other hand, was clearly exhausted, but there wasn't a mark on his face. Joe Humphreys raised Greb's glove hand and said, the winner and still champion, he cried, and the loyal Pittsburghers, in support of Greb went wild. After his victory, a sports writer asked Greb, how do you feel? Greb responded, how did those gamblers like that act I put on for them last night? Before laughing all the way to the bank, bank because he had put all his purse on himself. He literally just, <laughs> he done them gamblers superbly. Rumours have constantly surfaced that Greb and Walker had a second fight, but not in the ring a street fight. So many believe 
this to be true, but not according to Happy Allbacker, who said that Greb went to the Slipper Club direct from the Polo Grands. As he was getting out of the cab in front of the nightclub, Walker got out the one right behind them. Allbacker said that Walker told Greb that he was lucky to win, to which Greb responded, I would do the same here in the street, like what I had done in the ring. Allbacker said they squared off, but someone stepped between them. No blows were struck. They were sent into the slipper, took separate tables, and that was the end of it. However, Quinton Reynolds interviewed Walker, which was published about his supposed or this supposed street fight some 12 years later. He was asked if the fight with Greb was his hardest. And Mickey nodded and said, the second fight with Greb, I think I won that one indicating that they fought again. And of course, as Rickle suggests, they only ever fought once. Walker has since recalled his version of events in more detail. And he went, and he, this is what he said, he said he went to Billy Lahif's to meet his manager, Doc Kearns, and a lady as well, but bumped into Greb, who was actually sitting by the door. Witnesses actually suggest that they were seen having a couple of drinks together before leaving for the slipper club in the same cab. Well, as they got out of the cab, Walker suddenly turned to Greb and said jokingly, I just want you to know, you Dutch rat, that you wouldn't have licked me tonight if you hadn't struck your thumb in my eye in the 14th. Greb replied, Why, you Irish slug, I could lick you the best day you ever saw. Right now I'll lick you. Walker told James R. Fair what happened next, and he said, Harry made one mistake. He started to take off his coat. I waited until he had it halfway off, and then I let him have it. That punch would have knocked out anyone except Greb. It was a good punch and it dropped him and slammed his head up against a cab that was parked there. But he got up roaring. Then we went. And when he says he went, they started fighting it out in the street until Pat Casey, a police officer, stopped them and Walker remembered. He was a real right guy, that Pat Casey. He knew us both and he grabbed us and threw me in one cab and Harry in another and told the drivers to take us to our separate hotels. When Walker got back to his hotel, he remembered that he was supposed to meet Doc Kearns and his lady friend, so he began ringing around all night, all the nightclubs to track him down. Instead, he located his best friend, Billy Duffy, who told him, Doc isn't here, Mike, but there's a pal of yours here who wants to say hello. The person, on the other end of the phone, came to the line and said, I can lick any Irishman who ever lived. You yellow rat, why don't you come up here now, and I'll lick you again. When it clicked... And Walker replied, Greb, you come up here to the hotel and I'll flatten you in two minutes. Well, for five minutes, apparently they went on at each other and then the door swung open and Doc Kearns walked in. He immediately clocked what was happening and then he grabbed the phone and he said, listen, Greb, we'll fight you anywhere, anytime, but not in a hotel room or a nightclub. We'll fight you anywhere, anytime for 50 grand. Well, unfortunately, they never fought again. Ah, oh, what an amazing story. Absolutely loved that. Uh, uh, Harry, he ain't giving up, is he? He just, he, he's the same in the ring. He would know, he, he feels like he got the better of him on that street fight as well. Well, two weeks later and uh, Greb was back in the ring, this time against Slapsy Maxi Rosenblum. If anyone doesn't know, uh, another great light heavyweight. Uh, this was in a 10 round bout in Cleveland, Ohio. And, and the Cleveland press actually reported that Greb was an easy winner as well. And, as was anticipated, young Maxi proved entirely inadequate to the assignment handed to him. As was forecast, Greb carried too many guns for him and, and knew too much. And we think Greb could have stopped him almost any round had he cared to. Well, probably after a two week, two weeks on from that great fight with uh, Walker, no doubt he probably did want him to take his time. Now, it's incredible to think that Greb managed to fight another 15 fights over the Rosenblum victory, winning every single fight by the time he marked his 13th year in the ring. He was only 31, but had fought almost 300 documented fights, but it was probably more than that. Greb was looking to make another successful defence of his middleweight title, in a rematch against Tiger Flowers at Madison Square Garden on February 26, 1926. In a tough fight that most experts thought that Greb actually won, it was Flowers who was given the split decision. Regis Wells of the Pittsburgh Post gave Greb uh, winning, so winning eight to five, uh, so eight to Greb, Flowers five and two rounds of draw. Greb did suffer a cut 
Eyebrow in round three. He's uh, first since he fought Bob Roper in Buffalo. Greg fought flat-footed and was wild, not in the best form. And Frank Getty of the United Press said that many experts figured that the worst the former champion should have got was a draw, but Greb was the stronger puncher and at times had Flowers in real trouble. Hypey Gore stated that the, de- the decision had met with a deathly silence by the crowd. To some, it was just a just verdict. To others, it was unfair to Greb. My own tally had Greb in front by a margin of two rounds, five to Flowers, seven to Greb, and the others even. So it seems like Greb probably got are done by there well greb said afterwards i couldn't get going early last night and when i did it was only in flashes but even at that i thought i did enough to protect my title i was surprised by the decision but hope that when the time comes those who are now feeling sorry for me will learn that i can fight back a rematch was agreed six months later greb of course fought twice in between to keep himself in shape but it was proving difficult greb was interviewed in march and said this about his future I'm never going to let it be said that I stuck in the game after I should have quit. Why should I? I have all the money I'll ever need. When I get through this next Flowers fight, I'll have something like 200 grand left out of my earnings. The young fellows are never going to slap me around, but I do want a chance to get back on top again, and then I'll step out. I want my friends to remember me as a winning fighter. I would likely open a gymnasium in Pittsburgh and perhaps promote a few boxing shows on the side if I retire. Well, Harry didn't like journalists who wrote bad of him and would often confront them if he was informed of one slagging him off in public. Two were made to think again when he bashed him up. One even lost a mouthful of teeth. Many waited until Greb died before they actually bashed him in the public newspapers. He was labelled by one as a tightwad who somehow managed to die broke. Well, this was a misinterpretation of Greb, which was the complete opposite to a cheapskate who didn't die potless. He actually made a million dollars in the ring, but spent most of it taking care of other athletes in need of support, buying fancy clothes and having parties and having women, of course, as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe that he knew that it was it was it was probably about time for him to hang up his legendary gloves because before he fought Tiger Flowers on August 19th, 1926 at the MSG, Greb actually gave himself just two weeks to boil down from 175 pounds to 160. He didn't believe in heavy training, as we've mentioned. It sort of got to the, that point, arguing that boxers who pursue it often left their fights in the gymnasium. And he jokingly said, if I'm going to leave mine any place, it will be on a beauty rest with some skirt. I'm open to suggestions if anyone can name a pleasant way. And uh, <laughs> so he's obviously using sex as a way of exercise as well. So the United Press wrote this on the fight against Tiger Flowers. It said that the 15,000 fans or fight fans present was a Greb audience that came ready for a spectacle of the old time Greb fury. They saw plenty of rough stuff, but Greb's assault lacked the power of other battles. Flowers, on the other hand, fought a consistent fight and although forced by the Pittsburgh boy to alter his attack each time. Greb's rushes and wrestling became maudlin. Uh, He managed to regain his form. When referee Crowley announced the verdict, a Flowers victory, the news was greeted by a storm of straw hats and papers pelted into the ring by disappointed fans or friends of the Pittsburgh fighter. Greb was interviewed a day after the fight and had this to say. Well, That was one fight I won if I ever won any. So on September the 16th, the New York Times and other newspapers were actually given the story that Greb had been submitted to an operation for the removal of a traumatic cataract from his right eye at Atlantic City Hospital. He was expected to stay in hospital for a week with his eye covered, but this was just a smoke screen. The real reason for Greb being operated on what a complete was to actually completely remove his eye and actually replace it with a glass one. It has been written not once but hundreds of times that Greb boxed with a glass eye most of his life, which would have been an extraordinary feat. But the chances of an opponent not noticing his disability and taking advantage makes the claim a little bit less likely. However, what many of his opponents did not suspect was that he was blind in his right eye 
and had less than half the sight in his left. He fought at least a hundred major bouts when he was so blind in his good eye that, sitting in his corner, he couldn't tell his opponents from the handlers across the ring in their corner. His eyesight was so bad that he had difficulty identifying the opposite sex. The only way he could recognise a woman on the street was from the sway of a skirt or the smell of the perfume. And it was for this very reason that Greb decided to quit boxing and he said, Women mean more to me than anything else on earth. If I can't see them, I can't love them. So I'm hanging up my gloves. <laughs> what a great, way to, great reason to retire. Only Harry could retire that way. Well, on October afternoon, Greb was telling Mr. Allbacker, he's happy Allbacker, of plans to open a business for this men's gymnasium in downtown Pittsburgh. He was through with fighting there and all the glitter and the acclaim of the great champion, or in his case, a twice a champion, were behind him. And for the first time in his life, he was at peace with the world. Only Ada Edwards, his sister, knew of an immediate preliminary pram, which was obviously have minor, minor surgery on his nose, actually. It's weren't on his eye now. This is where some people get a bit mistaken. So this is surgery on his nose. So he had wanted, she actually wanted to be with him. And he told her, no, kid, you stay at home. I'll be back in two days. So in a good place in life and healthy, he boarded that train without telling anyone else where he was going. But he did whisper to a happy all back. He whispered in his ear, when I come back, I'll be beautiful again, he said. So three days later, Harry Greb was dead in Atlantic City Hospital, the result of hemorrhages following the operation on his nose, which had misshaped millions of times from punches. But remarkably, Greb had actually continued to drive with one eye and partially sighted in the other eye as well by this point and ended up in a car crash that broke his nose. He actually underwent a supposedly minor surgery to remove the bone splinters from the back of his nose. He failed to recover from his operation in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and he died on October the 22nd, 1926, at the age of just 32. And what a crazy way to go out at such a young age. And what could he have done following this? I mean, that's the first thing I think of is, you know, what would he have done in his life following this moment? Probably just chasing women around constantly for the rest of his life. But <laughs> yeah. The, the fact that this minor surgery obviously resulted in these hemorrhages, which caused him to pass away untimely, is just such a shame. But in them 32 years, he's packed so much into his life, in particular in the boxing ring, you know, documenting 300 fights or more. Maybe not even taking into consideration all the street fights he was involved in, all the fights in the <laughs> bars, everything that we've discussed through the course of the story. You know, all the other moments where he's getting involved in altercations outside of the ring. So when you put that into consideration, there's definitely over 300 fights somewhere. We'll never truly know what the case was, but the fact that he was involved in so many documented fights is, is pretty unreal, to be honest with you. The fact that he fought up at light heavyweight was, was unbelievable. The fact that you know, he was he was close at one point to potentially becoming a world light heavyweight champion. I mean, Gene Tunney, look what he went on to do in his career. And yet Harry Greb shared the ring with him five times throughout the course of his. He, he finally got his dream of becoming a champion in the middleweight division. And he's arguably regarded as one of the greatest of all time. And it's for this very story that we've covered in this episode, why people do consider him to be one of the greatest. Yeah, and, and rightly so. I mean, when you look, I mean, we had him, I think we agreed that he was the greatest ever middleweight of all time, literally because of who, how he continued to fight. I mean, the guy is what, he, he probably edged to 171 right at the end of his career. But let's be honest, he was in his best shape. He was a super middleweight, obviously no super middleweight division around at the time. So he fought heavier guys regularly and he, and the best of them, and Gene Tunney, and he caused him all sorts of problems, having five fights with him. I mean, he lost three, but it, by the sounds of it, especially with one or two of those decisions, they probably should have gone his way, or at least was a draw. But look, Harry Greb, what a sensational fight. I mean, he was, at middleweight, he was in, insanely good, so strong, moved quickly. And you've got to remember as well, as Paul Humphrey, we've constantly documented here, is, what, 10 years before he actually goes on to win a world title, or However long it is, I think it's five, seven years. He's, you know, he's blind in one eye. I mean, yep. it's insane to think that a guy fought with one eye as long as he did. And he wasn't even the champion at that point. And to fight so many fantastic fighters. And unfortunately, we didn't get the Dempsey fight. But what a guy. I mean, the stories are endless. But 
there's only so many stories we could stick in here, but there's there's, there's loads of them. And uh, what a colourful chap, though, Sean, eh? Absolutely colourful chap. A great, great character of the sport. And I am hope that we've been able to shed a bit more light on him with this episode. You know, there's some some great books out there. We've mentioned them in this episode. Good sources for the, this particular episode of Career Profiles. And we'd recommend, if you're looking into Harry Greb, you want to look a bit further, read the books as well. They've got a little bit of fact and fiction involved in them. But everything we've sourced for this episode is purely off facts that were that were provided by people that were around at the time. So we thoroughly enjoyed putting this episode together on, on the great Harry Greb. And we hope that we've been able to present you a story and educate you more on what this guy was really like and the stories that he was involved in. His career, of course, we've covered so much of it and in, in, in its entirety. And do you know as well the fact that we can only cover maybe the most notable moments of it the fact that he's had all these fights that we've mentioned earlier you know we've probably only scratched the surface of some of the the most notable yeah. things but these That's are the nice. most these are the most notable moments that that everybody looks into when they when they do look into harry greb so i hope that you know we've done him a little bit of justice by covering this episode on him and if you guys have enjoyed the episode then as always do let us know on social media on Twitter at career underscore profiles, on the BTR Boxing Podcast Network Facebook page or on the YouTube video. If this is how you're consuming it, you can do it on there. If you've not subscribed to us, you can do that on Apple Podcast. Make sure you've left a rating and you've left a review or you can find us on any other available podcasting app out there. A final big shout out to the patrons of this podcast. They will have access to this early. They'll have been listening to this before everybody else. And because of their support, they've allowed access to listen to these episodes. If you've not checked out our Patreon page, you can do that by checking us out on BTR Boxing Podcast Network Patreon page. You can find our patreon.com forward slash BTR Boxing Podcast. That's everything for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this tale of the one, the only, the fearless Harry Greb. <laughs>